Um, good evening. Welcome to the um, Tuesday, January 13th school board meeting. Um, could everyone here join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Um, before we start, I just wanted to publicly thank my fellow school board members for allowing me the opportunity to be chair this year. I'm honored to serve the community in that capacity with this team of people. Um, okay, Alan, adjustments to the agenda. Yes, I have a few quick adjustments. If you go under communications, uh, F will be the Chuanki plan, and Steve and Trish will be doing a brief presentation on that this evening. Uh, G will be MPA de uh, decisions, and Jeff Thorak will be doing that for us this evening. And I also have one that is H, which is Drummond Woodson uh, Conference in Augusta. I will probably combine that with the budget piece, which is A, because uh, Kathy and uh, Pauline and I went to that just to give you some updates on where that is as well. Thank you, Alan. Um, First, could we have um, a motion to approve the school board meeting minutes from um, the regular school board meeting on Tuesday, December 2nd? Thank you, Kathy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. All in favor? Rebecca? Thank you. Um, okay, the special meeting, Tuesday, December 16th. Um, could I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Second. Mary, thank you. All those in favor? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Trish, I think uh, you and I had a discussion about that meeting, and there was some question as to whether or not um, if we were in business meeting or we were in workshop. Uh, at that, that time, and when we discussed this, I believe Kathy said that we were in workshop, but yet I see that it's being written up as if it was a business meeting. So I just would like the school board to come to some sort of conclusion as to whether we were in workshop or we were in business meeting. Yes, we were in a uh, business meeting. Uh, it was my failure to take us back out to workshop, um, which somebody pointed out at the end of that meeting. So when we took our vote, um, which I thought was a straw poll. Um, we were still in business meeting. Probably would have been good to have notified the board of that earlier than when these minutes were produced, but thank you. Okay, um, any, any other comments or questions about that? Okay, um, all those in favor? All opposed? Thank you. Okay, um, <coughs> comments by student representatives. Start with the middle school. Oh. Um, I'm going to have to guys, have you go up there so you can be on TV. Uh, right now, all the winter sports, this includes cross country skiing girls basketball, ice hockey, and swimming are in full swing and under track is starting up soon. Uh, variety <laughs> show is going on tomorrow and this year it's going to be run by a group of 13 eighth grade students with help from Mr. Solander and Mr. Price and we hope everyone can make it to either a 2.30 or a 7 o'clock show. The spring musical this year is titled Once on this Island and it's starting up fairly soon with rehearsals. And it opens on April 4th, and that's also being presented by Mr. Saunder, Mr. Price. And there is no school on next Monday because of Martin Luther King Day. So. Um, some things that have been cut from the budget are the National Fitness Awards and the National French Exams. And I also have the numbers for the 2007 and 2008 fall sports participation. Um, in the fall of 2007, there were 198 athletes, and in 2008, there were 196 athletes. 
Oh, 169 athletes, so that's a 15% decrease probably to the, um, probably from students having to, from families having to pay. Um, and the career fair will be February 5th, and the next community day is in March. And that's all. Any questions? The national French exam. It's, um, well, I, I know what it is, yeah. but what, how did that happen? What? I, don't know. I think our school budget was taken down so much so that Can some of the things. Is that, yeah. Because it's cost. There's the, uh, the presidential fitness awards, the uh, present pan. So since the budget is frozen, we don't have funds to uh, pay for those items. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, anybody else have any questions for our, thank you very much, um, Andrew and or Sarah. Yeah, um, so we just got back from vacation, so there hasn't been too much going on, but next week is midterms, and um, something's going on at school. We've been working on issues surrounding the senior hall, um, privileges for seniors to be able to sit in it and just kind of study quietly. So. There are different issues with that being worked out right now. We had to, um, all the seniors had to sign a sheet with a sort of series of guidelines that not everyone has signed, so we're working on that. Tomorrow we have an SAC meeting where we're going to have a primary focus on school spirit and sort of ways to integrate the students with the town and just show more spirit. So that's pretty much all that's been happening at school. Um, additionally, um, I just want to speak a little bit about um, how we beginning, we in the school are beginning to see the effects of some budget freezes. Um, both Sarah and I participate in the journalism class um, and put out the newspaper, and we're unsure if we're going to be able to put out the next article. And um, we've seen some cuts and some losses in um, a couple of science classes with um, trips and labs that we were supposed to do, but just kind of keep you posted. Thanks. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I think we offer, offer um, any comments from the public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone who would like to comment? OK, seeing none, um, we'll move on to recognition. And I think we're going to move the order around, or are you, are you ready to go, Mr. Mullen? Well. <clears throat> in a sense, I'm ready to go. I just took a survey of the students behind me who are all part of Beauty and the Beast, and I said, we have technology problems. Do I wing it, or do we come back another time? They suggested winging it. I, however, am making the decision that since we had quite an intricate three-minute presentation for you, that we are going to come back, with your permission, uh, next uh, board meeting or after that. With your permission, we'll come back. That's fine, if you okay. would like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I should note, for Dick's sake, uh, what has happened is uh, he has a computer from this office up here. We don't have the password on it so that he can get in to you, do the DVD. So, uh, so we'll do it from there. We have one we've borrowed, but I don't know that it's going to work. So that's what the problem is at this point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Musical chair. Okay, um, high school teacher Ben Raymond, who has been selected as the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Centuries 2009 Great per Person Award winner. Alan, would you like yes. to Yes. Uh, the Century is one of the several newspapers that we get in this area. This is the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Century. Each year they have done a uh, program to award the person uh, of the of the year, and usually it involves nominations. Uh, the nominations are put in the newspaper. Thank you very much, and we'll well, be sure it works you. next time. Yeah. Uh, and so the nominations go in. People can send in votes. The person who gets the most votes is the person who receives the award. This year is Ben Raymond, who is a teacher at uh, Cape Elizabeth High School. Uh, he received the largest number of uh, awards. Uh, I did bring the article, probably most of you have seen it, but it's interesting to read it where Ben says in the beginning, 
I didn't even know I was a candidate <laughs> in the process. But uh, obviously, I think there are about 20 people who are on the list for the award. And so uh, during that process, he received that award. And what they looked at was his dedication to the school, his dedication to students. You will remember that is uh, either last year or the year before, he also received the SEAF Award uh, because of his work with uh, the uh, Thompsons and therefore received the Thompson Award at that point. Uh, ben is both a very popular teacher uh, in our special ed department, but is also a very popular coach. And so uh, this award, I think, was well deserved uh, in, the, in the notification. And so I think on behalf of the board and myself, I uh, offer him congratulations in receiving this award. Thank you, Alan. Um, kudos to the recent ice storm responders. Yes. Uh, an interesting process. Uh, if you'll remember correctly, the ice storm uh, that we had, I've even lost track of dates, about three weeks ago, I think it was. Uh, we lost electricity across town and in much of southern Maine. Uh, at that point in time, Mike McGovern, uh, as town manager, pulled a group of people together to begin to do some planning, specific planning, around the care of the ice storm. As it happened here in town hall, because we had a generator, we were able to work through the day, uh, and probably about 3 o'clock that afternoon, our power came back in this small section of the, of the town. But other than that, uh, electricity was out for some people. I understand there were some people out for up to three days at that point in time. Uh, what we did was uh, begin to work with the, town, the city of South Portland, uh, where we had an evacuation spot that was for both towns over there. But there were some people who really, really worked diligently to make this happen. And I just wanted to note them. Uh, they are uh, Charles Kennedy, who many of you probably have not met. He is the one for Cape Elizabeth who oversees emergency situations. And he did a tremendous job. I went to two of their meetings, and he was ready, had everything in place, had been in contact with the right people, et cetera. We also had Neil Williams, who is the chief of police. We had Peter Gleason, who is the chief of fire department. Bob Malley, obviously, who was uh, right there to help us out. Deb Lane, who was keeping track of what was going on, knowing that in many places we did not have phones here in Cape Elizabeth, and was trying to keep ahead of this. Ernie McVeigh uh, for maintenance, and I think I uh, mentioned to some of you, we had a real problem at the middle school in that the, uh, the, f the system that puts out fires uh, flooded at that point in time, and we had to get it uh, taken care of before we could allow the electricity even to come on in that building. And uh, Pauline, was there, and also I was, for meetings as we planned and worked our way through. Uh, if you watched in the newspaper, you saw an article by Michael which talks about town learns from recent ice storm. And this was really the first time we've had one to this effect. And so it gave us an opportunity not only to go through the process, but to go back and take a look at it and see what changes would need to be made if such an event happened again. So I just would like to acknowledge those people who worked in, on this process. I understand that there were some people who did go to South Portland for, uh, at, to the uh, community center in order to uh, find at some t in some places a place to sleep, some places a place to take a shower, and in some places just a chance to get away from a cold house over that three-day period. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, and thank you to those people that you mentioned as well. Um, Moving on to communications, the first item is budget. Yes. Uh, what, I, what I am bringing to you tonight is really a very brief summary of where we are at this point. Uh, first of all, there are two perspectives to the budget that I've been working on. One is the current operating budget of 2008-2009. That's the one that the people from the high school commented on, as did Steve's group, about some of the fi funds that are not available. We have received, although it has not been made official by the legislature yet, a $421,000 cut or curtailment in spending for this, this year. Uh, the legislature still has not acted on it. However, by the information we received from the governor uh, the other day, it looks like that curtailment will stay in place for 0809, and therefore, I must make a curtailment in the budget, and I'll talk about how we're going to do that in a minute. My understanding also is from Maine School Management that that curtailment of $421,000 will also stand in place for 0910 and 1011. 
And so that curtailment will stand in place for three years. None of this has been voted on by the legislature, so it is what we know at this point in time. We also know for 910 that they will relook at our general purpose aid to education, that it will be no more than it is this 0809 year and possibly it will be less. Uh, they are going to use the formula to check that amount and see where we are. Therefore, looking at 089, uh, we have received word from the town council about money they are going to put forward, and I think that will be mentioned in another piece of the agenda here tonight. Uh, we have also re-looked at the funding we have. Uh, hopefully, I will be in uh, the state superintendent's meeting on Thursday, and hopefully we'll receive the final word that 421 is the final figure, and that we will then be able to make the adjustments that are necessary so that we can open pieces of our budget uh, to take care of some of the needs that are going on. I want to be very clear that I have taken care of needs that have been brought to me that affect the running of the classrooms. And so I have uh, freed up science money for the high school, I have freed up some money for the middle school, and I have freed up some money for Pond Cove in order for us to move along. But keeping in very close tabs on where our money is, and how much money we will need in order to make this cut. Because certainly I know you as board members do not want that money gone and then find out we have got to have that money to make up the difference. So hopefully by next week we'll be able to readjust our funding and then uh, inform you and also inform the uh, administrators what things we will be able to fund and what we won't be able to. In the meantime for 0910, the fiscal year that is before us, uh, last week and this Monday, uh, Pauline and I have met with every administrator and have received their initial budgets based on your uh, agreement to a proposal of a possible 2% budget. You were very clear and we have worked very carefully to be sure that we understand that's a possibility. So we have, we have gathered that material. If you come up to my office today, you will find a three inch notebook that is, is loaded at this point with materials. Uh, Pauline is working right now to get those materials into a cash flow to show just exactly where each dollar would be spent and whether we are within the 2% uh, range. The uh, calendar that we have says to us that we are going to do everything possible to have that budget to you by the 4th as a board so that you have a chance to begin to look at it and discuss it. It is very clear as we've gone through this there are going to be things that each of you will be happy with and not be happy with. Probably more in the not be happy with than in the, with the happy with line. But that is the first, that is the first steps in the process. In the meantime, I will be meeting with the administrators on Thursday at 1030. Uh, to review what they've given me so far, to review what are the tracks that we see through this uh, budget, what adjustments do we need to make at that point in time. Once we have done that and once we have looked at those, prior to February 4th, it is absolutely essential that the administrators begin to talk with staff about what this is possibly going to look like. I continue to say it possibly, because it will, nothing will be finalized until you have had a chance to look at it, you've had a chance to ask questions, you've had a chance to make revisions of that budget. Uh, so, but we need to be sure that we are taking the appropriate steps so that people are informed about the thinking that is going on at this, at this point in time. I'll also be sharing that budget, that initial budget, with the president of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association, because I think that's very important for them to have an opportunity to see it. I have been asked by several public members if I would share it with the public. I don't feel I can do that at this point. I feel the first people who need to have the official on paper budget is the school board. And so that will be to you, uh, barring any problems, on February 4th. I will do a brief presentation of it on the 10th, and then by calendar we are due to have our first public workshop on it on the 12th. In the interim, we will be having a couple of other workshops, and again, that will, uh, Kathy will speak to that as we go through the uh, communication. But that is where we are right now. 
And I am trying to be as careful as possible as far as what type of information is getting out. Uh, I have had at times information that has gone out or supposedly has gone out and have had to get back to each person with their concerns about this. But we are trying to be as honest and forthright as possible, but also being very careful until we have this, the budget to propose to you, the superintendent's budget, that masses of information are not getting out. Gossip is there, stories are passing around, I know they are. And I have learned as of today, I can't control them all but I'm doing as much as I possibly can to, to control the information as it passes from one place to another. So that is, that is really the quick overview of where we are. And as I said, there are a couple of pieces that need to be added to that. And I don't know at this point whether that would be a good time for uh, Kathy to talk about the 21st and the 28th and do that. I think it would be great if I could just put uh, add one comment um, about the budget workshop that the school board had in December um, and to put a little context to the 2% target that Alan just mentioned because that, while that was a public meeting, it wasn't televised. Um, the school board discussed the 2009-10 budget as, as Alan referred to at our December workshop and this agenda item was discussed due to a rescheduling of our goals due to the ice storm or goal, work, goal setting workshop. Um, giving consideration to the current economic conditions the crisis in state funding and the preferences of the school administration and a, major a majority of the board voted to direct the superintendent to begin the budget process by preparing a budget which reflected a 2% spending increase. So it was a target and that's sort of the beginning, as Alan alluded to, of the process. Um, before Kathy goes on, does anyone have any comments or questions about the information that Alan has provided thus far? Okay, hearing none, Kathy, we'd love to hear about the next steps. Okay, um, I talked with uh, Ann Swift Kayata this afternoon, who is the finance chair of the um, town council, um, trying to put together the plan for January 21st, which is gonna be a, we're gonna call it a public forum, for lack of a better description. It will be here at the chambers at, at seven o'clock. Um, and what, what we've lined out, because we want to make sure that we're trying to send a consistent message is both boards will be here, the school board and the town council. We're still trying to figure out how we set up the room. Um, and what it's designed to do is for citizens to tell the two boards suggestions on three items. Um, where we might find additional revenues, where we might look at spending or service cuts, and what level of taxes people are um, feel are appropriate. So those three items we're going to be asking for people, we're here to listen that night um, so that we can get a sense. This is not a discussion about the budget. It's a discussion about those three items because the budget isn't laid out yet. We don't know what the budget is. But we wanna make sure we give citizens a chance to speak about that. And I um, would like to also encourage um, school staff members um, to come as well because they may also have those items, suggestions, um, because it's very important, as Alan said, that we're as open as, and honest as, with, as we can with everyone. Staff needs to understand what's going on. We're looking potentially at cuts next year of 09, 10, of a million five. And um, the discussion was had the other day there's not enough pencils out there to, to pick up a million five. So we come down to looking at salaries and benefits because approximately 82% of our budget is salary and benefits. Um, so not trying to scare people, just trying to be honest and straightforward and ask people to come and, and, and tell us what they think. So um, that's the 21st. The 28th, we haven't laid out completely, but the 28th is going to be another meeting of the school board and the town council. It's gonna be at seven o'clock. It's going to be at the high school cafeteria. And what I know so far, what we've laid out so far, which isn't a lot, but it is a chance for the school board and the town council to work together because we made a commitment to try to work together more than we've done in the past so that we all understand where we're coming from. We have different charges and we have different responsibilities, 
but we want to make sure that to the extent that we can work together and try to resolve some of these issues, that's what we want to do. So that's on the 28th. Um, it's at 7 o'clock. It is a public meeting, as is all school board and town council meetings. So I encourage people, if they'd like to come to the cafeteria, they can come there as well. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be looking for public comment at that point, but we'll find out um, once we lay that out, and we'll get back to you folks. Can I ask a question along those um, same lines? When it comes to feedback from staff, faculty and staff, specifically within the different levels, it, has there been sort of a give and take conversation already between principals and their faculty and staff where staff have been able, maybe in a less um, uh, intimidating environment, able to come forward or with the superintendent with their suggestions for cost savings and ideas around that. I, I don't know, perhaps it's already taken place, but I was just curious if that um, has occurred or if it's going to occur, maybe you have a plan if you haven't done it already. And I think if, if they would be willing to, I would uh, like to have each one of the principals just speak briefly to what they have done because I know that's been happening. Jeff, do you want to start and then go from there? Um, we have not had open-ended discussions about the topic because it can be difficult, uh, but I have surveyed, we started off several weeks ago uh, at a department chair meeting, sort of taking in the input from department chairs, and I, I actually gave them a survey with a number of questions about thing, items that they think are important for them to go forward, um, items that they see that could either their departments or the school they think could do without if need be. Um, and then later at the next, um, we, we did the same thing uh, for the entire faculty. Um, so I have gotten feedback from a lot of staff members about ideas that they have about what's most important, what can go if something needs to go. Um, and we've obviously, and one of the questions was obviously um, about does anybody have any creative outside the box um, ways to sort of look at things. So there's been a lot of feedback in that way. Um, there hasn't been a, a and, and then I've shared all kinds of information as, as uh, we get it from the superintendent and, and other sources about what the state of the budget looks like at this point. But there's been a survey, like you yes. said, that every teacher or faculty yes. staff has received, giving them the opportunity to share with you. Yes. Okay, great. Yep. Steve? Good evening. <clears throat> We had, uh, uh, back when we first began talking about possible curtailments uh, at a previous staff meeting, when that news first broke, um, we did have a staff meeting and talked about uh, what kinds of ramifications that would have because we were freezing the budget at the time, had to fill people in on that and what that would mean and how we go about trying to uh, fill in the needs and figure out exactly what it is that we were going to be particularly short on. And at the same time, we discussed um, options and the same, same idea. Let's, let's, no idea is a, a, a bad idea. There's no such thing as a dumb idea. Let's just talk. Any ideas, please bring them forward. Discuss them at your team meetings. Uh, team leaders also uh, have had some conversations about um, the budget issues and, and the impacts that it's going to have on the school. Some of the guidelines that we've been trying to work at with this have been the idea of uh, how do we insulate students from this? And it's, that's been a very difficult process because as we look for, for instance, $129,500 approximately for the middle school, and, and I know that the, these gentlemen face uh, similar numbers, then um, there, there aren't a lot of other places to look. We really have limited supplies, so when we take the next step, it's going to revolve around staffing and programs. So we've been looking carefully at that. Um, John and I have taken their feedback and tried to use that to make it as best informed decisions as we can. Thank you. At, at Pond Cove, I mean, it, like the rest of the schools and the whole community, we've been kind of overtaken by events. So the first few meetings were just awareness sec um, sessions. Mm -hmm. First to deal with the budget freeze and how we we're going to take care of that for this year. And then at um, team leader meetings, we did talk about various 
strategies or solutions that either the team thought of or they had heard of around the district, but it was really very hypothetical. As one shoe after another dropped, I thought there would be only two shoes, but there seemed to be three now. We had an open meeting one afternoon for the whole staff, not just teachers. Again, awareness, what is going on? Um, um, as Trish said, um, or maybe it was Kathy, with that kind of hit, it has to affect personnel. Because you know for the past, everybody's aware, particularly staff, that we have contracted other things in the past that way. So um, without making specific recommendations, uh, every, everybody is feeling that they're a little vulnerable at the moment. Um, I've also been talking a lot with PCPA because PCPA's role has changed now and they're getting very creative in a way uh, to support uh, basic services at the school. So that's where we are with it. And, and thank you. I mean, I think one of the reasons why I asked is I am concerned, like everyone else is, about staff morale and the climate in the school. So certainly being part, at least having the opportunity to share concerns or opinions or ideas and suggestions will um, probably help a little bit. Well, that and, um, and I've been urging patience on people, too, right. because the news seems to change every day. Right. And although I think um, people are braced for the worst, um, Morale is pretty good at the moment. Don, would you like to? So I meet with my staff every week, uh, Pond Cove Middle School and High School. And um, my staff, I had open discussions with one aspect. They already know about one of my major bu um, budget cuts, which is the out-of-district placement that you all know about, which I'm bringing, I can't tell you what sex or anything, but the, the students coming back into the district as of July 1st. So the preparation for that is huge, especially in the middle school, and Steve was at the meeting when we talked about it. Um, it involves multiple staff members from not only uh, middle school, but also Pond Cove. So they have to be aware, so they know that that is my 2% cut. So that's pretty much it. But I let all my staff know in all K through 12. Should I? Go ahead. Oh, and, and I would like to also mention that uh, there has been so much information flowing. Uh, several of us went to Augusta the other day to meet with Drummond and Woodson and Maine School Management to see exactly where we are at this point in time. Uh, there is another meeting on Thursday, which I will be attending, and there is a uh, county uh, superintendent's meeting next Thursday which will have legislators and people there to talk about the issues and how they are viewing it. Uh, I see Dwight is sitting down back. I have met with Dwight uh, to talk with him about some of the basics of where things are going. Dwight has been keeping very close tabs on the pulse of where things are and, and also is very clear on some of the concerns that uh, we have and what we're working with uh, as we move along. So what we have been trying to do, all of us, is to try to keep people informed, but yet try to avoid the panic situation as we move our way through. But I think any of us who's in education knows that in many, many years, this is the first time we've had to face some of the challenges that we're facing right now. So we're trying to do it as carefully as we possibly can in order to, to make those decisions. Uh, it's a slow process. Uh, it's a difficult process. The next couple of months will be even more difficult. But we are trying to be as honest and forthright and looking deeply at everything we do, keeping in mind the equation that everything we do affects students. And how do we do it the best way possible to meet all of those needs? So I'd like to thank all of the administrators who've been working with me. I'd like to thank Dwight, uh, who has come over several times. We've sat behind closed doors and talked our way through it and discussed it. Uh, not saying that we have complete agreement on everything, but we're trying to find ways where we can be absolutely sure that people are informed and are prepared and understanding what the process is. And I think from my perspective anyway, there may be people who disagree with me, but I think the process we have used so far has been a good process, although it has been a very difficult process as we've done this. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments on that topic? Will we move on? I do. Um, 
I'm wondering, um, as I'm looking at this um, public forum on the 21st, if the administrators can advertise it through their newsletters or um, and let the parents, okay, no. Um, the other thing that I wonder um, is if we might want to think about an anonymous system for staff members to um, submit ideas for cost savings. Uh, some people, some teachers or administrators or um, staff members may feel shy about speaking up in meetings. Um, they may not want to threaten um, anyone's turf. But I think in order to, to get all ideas, we may want to think about um, offering some way for them to anonymously make suggestions. And maybe directly to um, the school department. Or possibly that's something that Dwight and I could talk about as a possible process as well. Okay. I'd be more than happy to do that. And I would also mention that what Kathy presented a few minutes ago about the 7 o'clock meeting on the 21st, mm -hmm. the administrators have put out a first notice through their schools, I believe. I'm going to be giving them an updated notice tomorrow okay. talking about what exactly will be in that, uh, on, on that night, what the agenda will be. And my guess is it will be advertised or run on um, community television, a little um, PSA. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, um, town bond. I think that's me. Um, is that me? Where is it's that? It's not on the list. list. No, it, it, it's workshop on workshop. board goals. Okay, board goals. I apologize. I have the wrong version of the agenda. Okay, workshop on board goals. I think that's me. Um, <laughs> The school board convened on January 5th for a goal setting workshop. A list of approximately eight goals was developed. Um, and as the process continues, the school board will meet to review its committee structure from the perspective of how best to direct and focus our work toward accomplishing these goals. Um, the board will share the goals and the work of the results of this um, workshop with the district leadership team at the January workshop um, and have some discussions around that. And then we would hope to formalize um, and approve this list of the board at our next February board meeting. Anyone else want to add or share or comment on that? Okay, the next item, legislation. From my perspective at this point in time, the major piece of legislation obviously that I'm watching is the um, curtailment for 0809 and also what the planning is for 0910. I did talk with members of the legislative committee for the uh, so, um, superintendents the other day. Uh, the last of the bills, initial bills, are supposed to be in by the 16th of January. And so those bills will be uh, in place at that point in time. And then uh, the legislative group for Maine School Management, along with uh, Maine Municipal, et cetera, will be working and following those to see where they are at this point. Uh, I have been in contact with uh, Cynthia Dill, and also Mary, who's been working with her to give several pieces of information uh, about the unfunded mandates. And that information has gone to her, and I do have to talk with you, Mary, about that later on this evening. And also, um, the second piece was, oh, on fuel oil. I was trying to remember what the other one was that we did. And so we have been working on those. I think I also mentioned that the legislators will be meeting with Cumberland County superintendents on a week from Thursday. And at that point in time, we'll have legislators. We're also inviting the chairs of our boards and our town, our city managers to be there to have open discussions with legislators. Because obviously, one of the major pieces with legislation is nearly half the legislators are brand new people. And so part of it is teaching them what's going on, what the language is, et cetera. And so we will be doing that on the um, that Thursday, I want to say 28th, but I don't have a calendar in front of me. So we'll, we'll be meeting with them at that time. And I don't know, Rebecca, if you've gotten any information from Augusta or not. Um, no, but I would like to ask one question then just talk about two other things, if I may. Um, Alan, if, uh, would you please share with the board what was developed around unfunded mandates? Because I think that that would be very helpful for the whole board to see. Um, and then secondly, uh, 
at our workshop, we did at our workshop at our business meeting before the workshop. The, the school board did approve a uh, letter to the governor, commissioner of education, the appropriations committee, and the committee on education, um, expressing our um, thoughts about the curtailment and general approach to the. Um, state budget 10% uh, cut across the board and, and how we thought it should be um, perhaps handled differently. Um, in addition to that, we are working on a letter to our federal, um, or uh, Senator Snow, Senator Collins, and Representative Pingree, and I'm wondering um, whether we can officially vote on this this evening if the board would feel comfortable doing that. I know that um, the the draft has gone out to the board. People have gotten back with suggest changes. Um, I do feel that this is a timely, an issue of, time, of timeliness because I think that there's going to be some pretty rapid movement in um, Washington, D.C., and perhaps by the time we meet again in a business meeting, we may, it may be too late. Trish, unfunded mandates first. Uh, what I was going, what I'm going to do with the unfunded mandates is I uh, had explained to Cynthia and Jane and Larry the other night is that Dom, as president of uh, his organization, uh, they have been working on a very s strong list of unfunded mandates, both federally and local and statewide. And so I just, uh, Dom is, uh, I think he's trying to get his computer to work at this point in time. But Dom will speak to it uh, quickly. They met on Friday in Augusta and really looked at those unfunded mandates and what we need to do about them. So Dom, are you comfortable at this point in time? Yes, yeah, yeah. my computer doesn't shut off. And Alan, um, this is unfunded mandates from the instructional support side, but I'm assuming that there's more than just that, and in terms of, I know, like the wellness initiative. It's not just instructional support. Okay. We did everything. We had the assistant, uh, the commissioner's been out of, um, out for a little while, and the assistant commissioner, uh, Angela Flaherty, um, was there to hear us. They're going down to all the major organizations. We were just the first one. We were lucky enough to uh, um, have the first hit on them. So they're going to MPA, Superintendents Association and the MMS, hey, your, your organization. So um, I can give you the list that we came up. It is specially at focus, but there's, they're, they're, ulti they're ultimately linked with other areas. Yeah, I don't know. If, do we need to hear it verbally? It must be pretty long, especially if it's going to be. I, do you want, I can do it in two I seconds. Think you can do it fairly quickly. Uh, okay. Trish, do you want, uh, just, the, just the overview. Sure. Um, here are the different areas, which they are, and again, these are un federal mandates are coming down. Those are the largest ones. So I can tell you the gifted and talented program is a large mandate. We don't get any money and we have to do a lot of those type of um, regulations. Response to intervention, that regular ed law, which is in a special ed law, huge. Lots of work, no money attached to it. Uh, Section 504, good luck. This is going to be something that will plow every system over. President Bush did a nice job setting that standard where it's allowing anybody with a disability to have protection. Um, Dom, can you, I'm sorry, yep. can you speak a little, can you speak a little more to that, the Section 504? I'm sorry, I'm sure everyone here has a better understanding of it than okay. I do. do you, okay, Just Section 504 is a broad disability law that goes into the workforce. Okay. Um, so basically what happened is they expanded that to different areas. Typically it's an inability to think, um, speak, you know, really broad disability. They opened it up to concentration, le uh, learning, um, a lot of different other areas. We haven't really been trained on this. Our, our next week, next Friday, I go for the schools, how it impacts school. Okay. But it used to be a substantially limiting. So the disability had to substantially limit your ability to access the general curriculum. Okay. Now it's mild. Okay. There's no, there's no OCR. Uh, the Office of Civil Rights has not come down. What is mild? Okay. Could be anything. So it, it, it could be just a mild impairment. but. Those costs can access a lot of different services in schools, nurses, um, and things like that. So it's something that is very concerning, but it's a federal mandate. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, tutors um, and certification around tutors. You have to have certain tutors with certification. State forms. There's multiple state forms. Infant campus. How the amount of money that we have spent on other types of da databases. I mean, we have three going on just in my department. Um, PAPES, which are part of the kneecaps in that whole area. The kneecaps was a huge thing. That's a regular ed thing that's coming, but all 
so the, all of the um, standards that were in Chapter 127 are going to have they're all they're scratching them. So in the new local in the lo old local assessment, all those type of things are going to have to change, and that's you know an unfunded mandate because it's it's money that's that you have to spend time in professional development. Um, the state diploma, that's a 43-page document that, that is um, trying to get pushed through right now, and that has a lot of unfunded mandates in it. I don't even need to go into it. Um, special education is an unfunded mandate. You don't get 100% of that. EPS formula, it's, there's a lot of stuff in that, which I don't have to get into it, but there's unfunded mandates in that, which where they take our Medicaid money and our federal money, and they deduct it from what we should be getting. That's just a little thing. State performance plan that we have to track graduates, some graduates, maybe, and even in the graduation law that's coming, we might have to track all graduates. So, ELL access testing, we have to pay for that. PAPE trainings um, and PAPEs and the unfunded mandate around that, um, that's under No Child Left Behind. There's some uh, unfunded costs in CDS with four year old programs, and that is pretty much it. There's also like free and reduced lunch. I mean, you can go, there's lots of little ones that are coming. Uh, also, the biggest, the, the graduation requirements is a big one because what's going to happen for special education is that we're going to get every referral under the sun. And in my data, when I show you my budget, the SST teams have cut referrals unbelievably. So that, will, that trend will, will go the other way. Um, lots of cuts in wraparound services for, for um, students with the, whether the disabilities in the community, they're going to come back on to the school. The school will be the only source. So um, for help, that's what we're, we're worried about. Uh, and I th legal costs will be huge. So that's an unfunded mandate as well because we have to protect the each system. So those are just some of the things or other ones in, I'm sure that main parent uh, MPA will do. And at least we'll give you, that was just a list that we did in two hours. So. Um, can I yes. ask another question, Dom? Um, do we have any idea, roughly, dollar amounts on this? I, I wonder if Representative Dill, if that would help her, if she was trying to um, you know, put a bill forth. I, I'm sure it's really difficult, but. They're interlinked. I don't know how to really put um, a dollar sign on it. It's just get, it keeps getting absorbed in the system. So, I, I mean, for us, I don't know how, how to figure that out. <coughs> Quantify it, OK. I mean, it's hard to quantify it. Like 504, mm -hmm. sometimes we use our staff and we use regular ed staff. We use, you know, the nurses. Um, we use some of my staff. We use guidance counselors, um, RTI. It's stipends that we use uh, for the SST teams, the NWA costs, the DRA costs. I mean, you could probably figure that out. It would take a long time to mm -hmm. go down. Gifted and talented, I can't even, I can't even get that off the ground. I mean, because it's only just me. Right, <laughs> so. okay. Um, I, th I think that's pretty much, it. you could quantify it, it would just take some time to put it together for a system. Mm -hmm. She may just need rough yeah. quantification. And Dom and I had a discussion about that today also, yeah. and uh, it is, is a, there are so many key factors in this from hiring staff to, as he said, sure. giving stipends, et cetera, in order to make this work. Mm -hmm. And as Rebecca said, there are other things above and beyond these as well, but uh, I, I personally would like to thank Dom because he has provided strong leadership at the state level uh, in order to get this information out. And I know some of the information, I'm not sure, was uh, looked for as deeply as the way they went about it. So I think it's been very, very important to get that out. And it was Dom's leadership who made that happen at the state level. So I appreciate that. Any other questions? I could forward this to you guys if you want. Do you want it as a document? Yeah. It's going to help Rebecca in her analysis of the privatization of the um, Cape School system. Oh, yeah, that's coming right along, too. <laughs> um, the other question I think you had, Rebecca, was the letter. And I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. I don't know that we've had an opportunity to talk about it, although I'm, I'm realizing the time sensitivity. Um, I'm wondering if we could suggest that people have communication or send additional review and edit, and if we need to, to have, go into business um, session at our next meeting, which I think is a week from tomorrow, the 21st, mm -hmm. um, and approve it at that point. And then, I mean, that's a public meeting, if that would be okay. Because I understand, just want to give people the opportunity to 
Oh, yeah. The only question I have is if we send revisions and changes to Rebecca, does that not constitute doing business over the <laughs> It depends if they're, if they're substantive or not. If they're just um, stylistic issues. Um, well, spelling corrections, like Chris. Spelling know. correction style, stuff like that, should not is not business. Right. If, but um, what, what I did want to um, talk about this evening were just some of the points that I had raised um, and what some suggestions that Alan and, and Mary um, and Karen had brought up, so it, it is transacted in the public. So, right, right. Um, so I would say that if you go through whatever, I, I have sent out the latest version with the changes in it to everybody, so you can see what was added. Um, and if you need to, if you would like to suggest something that is more than just grammar, so please hold off until our meeting, um, and we can discuss it then. But if it's okay, if I could just, because we are not going to be, um, broadcasting on the 21st, and I think it's important for people to know that this is what we're talking about. I think she, you're talking actually about the 20th, right? The 20th. No, I'm sorry, the 21st. It is the 21st at 8 a.m., the committee meeting. So the school oh, board the is is in a public meeting, <coughs> right. although not televised. So. It's not televised. So if, is, it, is it okay with anybody if I just briefly kind of go over what this is about? Are you looking for a vote tonight, though? No. Oh, okay. Um, Yes, the, the key points without going in. Yes, I'm to not going reading to read the letter. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have proposed to the um, school board that we write the senators and our representative um, about the curtailment that we are facing this year and the potential um, cuts to our resources and programs next year, and asking them to. Um, specifically asking them to support several things that will be before them in Washington, D.C. First is a stopgap local block grant to avoid drastic cuts to public education. That has been proposed to them. And um, fully um, or increasing, major increase in the federal funding of the IDEA special education mandate. Um, and also um, to deal with the 504 legislation. Um, that was um, added by Alan. Um, Mary also suggested that we put in there that we would like to ask Congress to reevaluate the effectiveness and the costs associated with No Child Left Behind. Um, and then finally, uh, we added in that with skyrocketing energy expenses, um, we would encourage them to incorporate assistance to schools in creating energy efficient buildings and facilitating the use of alternative energy sources. So that's where, oh, um, and actually, yes, that's right, that's where we stand. And just to clarify what Kathy was saying, are we, I mean, if someone sends out a letter and asks for feedback, we're not allowed to give feedback because it's a business transaction if you give feedback? Not substantial feedback, that's correct. You, you should so be So we need to, like, compose the letter together as a group? No, you, know you have to like, talk about your substantial feedback in a business meeting. So if you said, geez, Rebecca, I don't like that first paragraph. I think it's got to come out. Okay. You shouldn't be doing that through the email to Rebecca. You should do it in the business meeting in public. So, it, it, you know, it's so, like, it seems so cumbersome on it us is. To, to have but to. It is very it is cumbersome. In case, it, when we did the letters on consolidation a year ago, remember, right. we set a meeting right. to discuss that. Right. It's very cumbersome. <sighs> Okay, um, legislation, that was all under, any other comments, questions? Okay. Um, Deb Casey's seafood. All right, something positive here <laughs> for a change. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, if you remember correctly, I've said to you, a lot of these, a lot of these travel uh, programs do not have to be approved by the board, but I think it's important that you know about them. And so this one is from Deb uh, Casey at the middle school. And this is a SEAF grant that she just recently received, which will allow them to go to the Museum of Fine Arts and the uh, Map, Map Ararium at the Mary Baker Eddy Library in Boston. They're looking at going in April before the vacation. Uh, they will be there for the day. It will not be an overnight trip. And it will give them an opportunity to see some of the uh, exciting things that are available in the Boston area for them. There is, uh, from her, uh, my understanding from her, there is no cost to anyone. It is, it is funded by SEAF. 
And so that's the way it will be done at that point in time. So she did send me a very brief uh, outline again because I just like to have you, excuse me, know when kids are, are leaving mm -hmm. town to go somewhere else for a trip. And some of you might want to ask if you could chaperone, but that's not my problem. That, that's yours <laughs> to do. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Um, IDEA requirement. Uh, Hi, Dom. Dom. Would you like to speak to that briefly, please? That's another piece of good information, so. I'll try to be brief on this. This is a, also a very complicated report. So in here, there are several indicators that the, um, comes from IDA, which is the Individual Disability with Education Improvement Act. So that's a federal act that we have to, that they send to the state of Maine and then they monitor us. So each school system around the state is monitored. We are, I don't have the count, but last year we were only seven out of, out of all the districts in Maine, well 200 and whatever, we were seven districts made complete compliance. And again this year we made complete compliance. And I have to all, it has to be because of my staff. I have the best staff ever so and thank you for letting me hire the best staff so and they're continuing to do this a couple trends I just I'm not going to go through all of these but it basically talks about enrollment um, there's certain indicators that they do that dropouts and I just want to um, just kind of give one new program at the high school the choices program some of you have been there um, we have several kids that are not um, identified they're in that program that would be dropouts right now so they're getting, pro, they're getting services, so it's a quasi-special ed, quasi-alternative uh, ed. And a lot of people don't know that, um, so some of these kids are being saved that way. Because we do have several kids over the last several years that have dropped out. Now, we met the compliance, but I don't think, I think one kid is too many. So that's what we're really trying to work on. And the SST teams at the schools, especially at the high schools, we're really trying to monitor that. Um, so you have dropouts. Uh, suspension and expulsion, and I think because of these programs and because of the staff and the and the at you know the leadership and the A team that we're trying not to expel or suspend kids, we're trying to find alternate ways to do that. Um, so we don't have that many, but we met that prong as well. We're not on AYP in the middle school. We were on AYP in special education uh, for math, and thanks to a new program that helped us get off that. And uh, and thanks to Steve, he we really worked hard with our staff to do that. Um, so we didn't make AYP this year. The classroom placement, I do want you to note that. We didn't meet our benchmark there. We met the benchmark, but we really didn't because that's the, the, the pendulum is, is moving away from inclusion and mainstreaming because really that's not the essence of special ed. In the 80s, in the, I mean the early 90s and 80s, they pushed inclusion and mainstream cheaper, throw them in the classroom. Kids with disabilities, processing disorders, they can't learn the same way. There's, they need specific, targeted, direct instruction. The pendulum is, switch, is swinging back, and that's what we're providing. So earlier on, so in, Ta in you know, Pond Cove, we're trying to provide a lot more direct instruction. The research is there, early intervention. We're getting kids kindergarten, first grade. So we're really, they're not in their mainstream a lot, but we're getting them earlier so they can get back in the mainstream so they don't have to be... Um, stigmatized as much. So that's an, another one and on the back is just another explanation of the MEAs which will now change because now will be the kneecap so that will all change in that data. I don't, who knows where that's going to go. Um, parent involvement which is important. We met, um, we met that target as well so and, and I also email all my parents. I try to keep them informed with I have a blind CC, so every parent that has, is, that has a child with a disability, they get emails from me. So, and we keep them informed. We have a parent group that I don't even attend, that I have, and we're in a grant um, from the Department of Education, and they work closely with certain parents. So that's the target. Nice questions. I have just a few comments and, and one question. Do you want to go? Um, I notice that the 10%, we have about 10% of our students are special ed, if I'm, if I'm interpreting this correctly. Yep. And I think what I was struck by is that it's um, not a disproportionate number of kids compared to other communities, because there does seem to be a myth circulating that we seem to attract a lot more special ed kids than other districts, <coughs> so. 10%, and we're 10% this year. This is last year's data. Okay. And this year's data, which I will give to you in my budget, is 10%. Okay. We're staying consistent. The population is staying the same, even though, again, I keep saying that, even though the overall population is, is, is moving down. 
we are a shopping district. Right. I mean, when you have this on the website of the Department of Education, out of seven districts, and Yarmouth is one, Falmouth is one, they shop here. I mean, they the Yarmouth will, is one. I found that out from a, yeah. I'm a school board member up there that he yeah. thought that they were the most attractive district for people to, looking to apply their, you know, get their kids in good special ed programs. But then um, I did notice the increase in the self-contained and the out-of-district placement, which you explained, not so much the out-of-district yeah. placement, but the self-contained, that pendulum swinging. But my question to you is the post-high school status. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? That didn't seem to have the numbers, the data yeah. on it, and why is that? Yep, because what happened is they are con the Department of Education is contracting with Transition Network of Maine. And what they were going to require us to do, which is another unfunded mandate, that my office is going to have to call every graduating senior and track them down, make sure what they're doing, ask them a survey question, and we have to have a certain percentage of those. For our district, I think we can do that. We have, you know, very good parents. They're around. There's, you know, most of the parents are, you know, together. You, I, I feel for my other director friends that are living in areas they can't even get the kids to school. So that would be a nick on them. And so, and these performance indicators are going to be attached to money. That's what they're pushing that to. So if we don't improve, if you look in some of the rubrics, if you don't improve, they'll take your federal money away. If you're already doing well and you don't improve above doing really well, you're not going to get money? Well, there's always the, no, I think we could. We might have to work on certain things. If you don't get money, that mean, if you, that's a really, I haven't heard of one district that hasn't got money, but they could push that, especially the biggest thing that the federal government is coming after the state of Maine for is transition services for kids with disabilities. Yep, okay. um, dropouts, 0506. We had 155? No, that was the total, that was a graduation. Otherwise <laughs> uh, known as the graduation. <laughs> <laughs> it it kind of skews your average a little bit when your whole class dropped out. They, they break out the uh, dropouts for special ed and regular ed. So you look down, see SP indicator two, dropouts and exits by dropout. So the exits are people, the kids coming in and out of the system. Yeah, so in, I still don't understand why yeah, they have 100, that, that's an error, look, right? Look down, that, yeah, the exit great. by dropout special ed is 100.5. Zero, zero yeah, no, I get that. But and I look up there, the total dropouts for a number of, see the 100, the, that's 134, I don't know where you're seeing the 150. Now, number, so number two, indicator, SPP indicator number two under 0506 shows total dropouts of 155. So yeah, it's clearly just a mistake. There, there was, if I, and Don wasn't Thank here you. at that point, so okay. if I could just take, Jump that, in. take that one off. <laughs> Please do. There was, there was one year, and it keeps coming back to us, and I, it's this. been a couple of years since it's come back to us, where it was reported to the state in error that every single one of our seniors dropped out. That's the number. We, we clarified that with the state, <clears throat> that in fact we had graduation this year, but I guess the number is still embedded Unbelievable. at some In the level. system. It still has did affect our performance. That's his fault. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all, all the special ed kids were able to graduate. It's so. <laughs> not the right. Okay. Jeff, before you, before you go, I mean, the next year it says 27 dropouts. That's still a really high number, given our, right? our student, our graduating class. It's 4.6%. But that we've, seems highly unusual. I have the not numbers seen that I've these numbers. Seen I have are, not seen these numbers before. There's that. no way we've had 27 kids drop out no. in any given year. I'm just thinking. Typically, we, we wanna, have. We may just want to give yeah, Augusta I, again a heads up that there's something still wrong. Typically, we have zero to two. That's that's why they're really trying to crack down on the data. So <laughs> anyway, it's accurate. So ours is accurate. <laughs> I don't know. So you just may want to let them know since we're being graded on this, you know, by the state that maybe their numbers aren't quite right. Hello. Okay. Um, number five, classroom placement um, versus self-contained, and you're saying the pendulum is swinging. Will that mean that the state's um, target will also swing in Hopefully. acknowledgement of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And part of that, part of that self-contained placement is the level of students that we have now. As most of you know, when I've taken you around to the self-contained programs and the life skill programs, and looking at the the kids that we're now serving in those, that's why. I mean, we, we, we do have, and I, I just met with directors and we talked about this in front of the assistant commissioner, kids are different now. And we're looking at, the kids are surviving at different rates, the NICUs and the hospitals are saving more and more kids that have traumatic birth and they have, when they come through the preschool and they go through CDS, child development services, they have disabilities. 
Some of them are very traumatic and could be medically induced. Um, and we have, we have a lot of kids with different types of disabilities and we serve them very well in our community. And the out-of-district placement coming back is another test to the level of staff that we have that are willing to take on a student and work really well to make sure that they gain and have an appropriate program. Anyone else with you also, anyone else with questions? I just wanted to thank, in spite of the data errors, <laughs> I just wanted to thank you and your staff and the other school administrators for working with these students. I think that a test speaks to um, your achievements. So thank you. Um, Shawanki. Steve? Oh, hers. <laughs> okay. Okay, Chiwonky. Um, uh, the start of this year, we were anticipating the 24th year of trips from the middle school to Chiwonky. Now, I think if you talk with students about that, typically when they come home, they talk with parents about uh, there were no bathrooms, uh, asking what a white flag is uh, out in the woods, a sea far. Uh, there, there were no showers, uh, we cooked our own food, they're going to tell you they traversed across a gulch, they're going to tell you they did rope uh, courses inside a barn climb, they're going to tell you they went on wild goose chases and things like that, and how, how bad the weather was or how good certain parts of, it, of the experience was or was not. So uh, the, the range of responses is going to vary, but some of the things that, they, they, that we see that they may not see in that same program until much later are the important aspects of character development and, and a huge piece for kids who are in the adolescent age range is the development of their own identity, their self, how they see themselves. We just had a book group meeting tonight, uh, today after school on the price of privilege and that's one of the key focus points in that book is that students at this age really need to develop that self and they need to be able to do, do that in a in a safe environment, but they need to be able to make good choices, and they need to be able to make bad choices, and they need to see how consequences work out from both kinds of decisions. So um, without that crucial development of self uh, and the promotion that, that this kind of learning takes uh, causes, and that is a, a culminating event and has been a very special part of our curriculum for such a long time, um, we think that uh, our, our programming for sixth grade students and things that we want them to carry on with them would be uh, greatly limited. So um, when the budget freeze came, part of the situation I was faced with was there's about a $9,800 cost that we cover transportation, shortfall uh, of hardship cases, uh, substitute accounts, and teacher stipends uh, and hourly employee wages. So uh, for the overnights. So without those funds, that meant that something that we had really not considered possibly up for uh, uh, to see an end of a kind of program like that, it looked highly possible. That, and so I sent an email out to parents in the community to say the, at the, today's middle school parents association meeting, that was going to be the topic of discussion. Well, between the email that I sent last week and probably two days after that, a group of community uh, members um, that uh, Trish is going to speak to in just a sec. I think a second. I think you have the, the write up for that. Um, some some folks came forward to do some some donations and to cover the shortfall that we would experience for this trip. So that meant that the school portions were covered as usual and that the uh, MSPA did agree as usual to do the, the $90 per student and that leaves parents with a $150 cost per student which is typical for that program as well. Um, Trish, do you want to take a second right now and just uh, talk about those? Sure. I, on behalf of the school district, I think it's important to thank the following people and organizations um, who are going to allow Chimonkey to happen this year in spite of um, budget situation. Glenn Rudberg and Ted Darling from Ethos Marketing, um, Tom Gale and Vaunt Web Marketing, and um, two additional donors who wish to remain anonymous but who will pick up that shortfall. So thank you very much to those organizations. So that was, uh, 
that was an incredibly quick action on their parts. Now, some, for example, um, some of the people in there, Ted Darling, he doesn't have students in the middle school. He doesn't have students at Pond Cove. His students are in the 10th grade. His children are in the 10th grade and 12th grade. So when you look at that, one of the conversations that I had with Ted Rudberg was that, uh, excuse me, Glenn Rudberg, is that um, he said, you know, we really want to see that th this, the, the equity of this program is extremely vital in this community. Uh, what, what this carries forward for kids, what they can take with them that they may not even realize. So they definitely got the, the message about what uh, Chiwanki will do for children. And, and how they can help them as they progress into adulthood. So um, we're, we're extremely grateful to them for doing that, and they wanted the, uh, they, they didn't really want to have a, a lot of debate about it and, and for Chuanke to lose any equity in the process because it's an extremely vital program. Now, one of the things that I've been asked um, from some of the email responses that I got were, uh, there, there are some people who said, you know, this, how can you choose to keep a program like that when just prior to the vacation you sent out a kind of like a wish list, like a giving tree wish list, but an electronic version that asked for tissues and asked for um, dry erase markers, things like that. You don't have basic classroom supplies, you don't have some textbooks you need, but you're going to support this program. And my simple way to look at it is, what does that tell you about that program? I would forego the tissues and the dry erase markers for the next 15 years, if I could, to continue to send students to Chiwanki. That's the value that I place on that. Um, if, we, if we need to come up with some dry erase markers, hopefully Ruth's Reusables will, will have some for us, or, or we'll come across some through some donations or whatever, whatever happens. If we don't, we'll figure something else out. But um, you know what? I can't replace Chiwanki. Thank you, Steve. Any questions, comments? I was just going to comment that since I have a sixth grade student, I was able to see all those emails because all of the parents did. I was actually um, very encouraged and impressed by how thoughtful all of the responses were on both sides, but the overall the overwhelming support of the program. I thought not only spoke very highly of the program, but I, I'm really glad that, that conversation was able to happen. And the, the response, obviously, and the, and the result um, is also very exciting. Yes, it was probably 75-80% uh, supporting the program, uh, a, small per a smaller percentage um, saying that maybe it's time that that program um, did not continue and, uh, or stopped and then there was a, 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 I did hear from some folks who were saying that the, this is going to be a hardship and, and we do take care of the hardships every year. We work very hard to make sure they, that Chiwanki just looks at our program, our school, and says, what you get from us, we get from you as well. Because every year we send all of our students and we bring them some very interesting cases. And they, they don't see them from schools who have options of where the kids are going to attend programs. Um, and so they have actually added a lot of their elements that they have there and a lot of their activities um, based on the needs of Cape Elizabeth's population and it has benefited other school systems and other groups. So we have a very good two-way street working relationship. Can I say one last quick thing? Thank you for making it happen. Well, now if uh, Charlie will sign me up, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, MPA, do you want to? Jeff Thorak. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I'd just like to thank uh, Alan for all of his communication with the, with the curtailment. Um, I've been talking frequently with a lot of my colleagues, and um, they're really sort of out in the dark right now, and uh, it's amazed. I'm just absolutely um, struck by that because of uh, the impacts that this is going to have um, program-wide and, and statewide and, and nationally. So um, thank you, Alan, for keeping us all updated with that. I think uh, I feel very uh, informed and uh, a little bit more prepared um, to sort of address these future issues. So uh, I, I do appreciate that. Um, recently, I think you may have heard a little bit of uh, the, 
Maine Principals Association ad hoc committee that was formed to address some of these um, uh, shortfalls um, at, the, at the school level and uh, in regards to athletics. And it, it, I think we've seen it in the local newspapers, um, sports radios had a number of conversations on, and uh, I think there's been a lot of communication and the stands um, in regards to this. So exactly what I wanted to do is just kind of present some, some real information um, just to give a brief summary of what that means and some of the, the areas of recommendations at this ad hoc committee. And again, it's, these are recommendations that were presented, um, that will be presented to the Maine Principals Association and the uh, Interscholastic Committee, which will be voting on that in January 26th. Um, but some of these recommendations mean uh, that limiting the amount of accountable competitions. Um, and that may impact some sports from two that play on a consistent basis to possibly one for a team that may compete at uh, once a week. Um, it also is looking at the length of the sports season and reducing that by one week. Um, also, uh, the amount of teams that qualify for a playoff. Right currently, we're at a two-thirds um, of the teams that participate in a playoff. Potentially, that may be at 50% and that would really in impact the preliminary qualifying. Um, and one of the other recommendations was a freeze on uh, the officials, uh, the increase in officials fees and a travel um, for officials as well. And finally, the last one, um, the New England, uh, eliminating the New England competitions uh, for the main schools um, straight across the board. Uh, right now, <coughs> right now that's, a, that's a district um, the New England participation is a district decision and uh, the main principles is looking at maybe making that a um, standard. Uh, what I've done and I've put together some information and this may not, the information here and the numbers that I provided um, are strictly based on these recommendations. They're not necessarily, um, they aren't a reflection of my own personal um, uh, opinions on this matter. They're strictly um, looking at our programs and the impact that these decisions may make. Um, so I think we've talked, you know, in my presentation, I think I've shared my, my feelings on the importance of athletics um, to the school board. The, my, my, strong feeling for the value of athletics and, and the role that they play in our, in our young, in the young people that we uh, educate in their lives. So um, again, this, what I presented strictly would be a um, condition of these recommendations um, and how they impact capitalism with athletics. And I think just as a quick uh, summary as well, we've made some pretty decent strides, I think, with Western Maine Conference and the, the SMAA, which is the larger public schools. Uh, we've met last week and went through each sport and tried to develop some ideas on how to address some of these travel concerns and trying to regionalize things a little bit. And uh, I think we've made some really fantastic strides there. Uh, that, that communication has really never taken place and, and this was an excellent first step I think in trying to um, really address some issues that needed to be addressed. So I, I was really pleased to be part of that. I think it's again I think it was a great first step. Um, and we're also looking at other states that are experiencing the same things. Uh, the, the MIAAA, which is the uh, main Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association, is working with New York, working with Massachusetts, trying, you know, I think if we can work together, there might be some, another state association that may have come up with a great idea. So um, we've made strides in, in taking um, that step there. And um, this Friday, the Western Maine Conference prin principals and athletic administrators will be meeting as well to uh, address this. Um, collaboratively and uh, send our recommendations as well to the main principals association. Um, so I think there's a lot of good things that are that are happening right now. 
um, trying to address this in a positive way, and again, as Alan mentioned, trying to do it in the best interest of our students. Um, so that's, that's basically it. In a, any questions or comments? Yeah, more than happy to take some of those. I just have a question because I think one of the things that struck me in the conversations that I've heard is a concern of draining the athletes from the high schools and just the schools in general and those athletes going to the travel teams yeah, I think, teams. And can you share just a little bit sure, I about think, that um, concern? I, that, I think that's a major concern with some of these. By putting some of these restrictions, you know, I think one of a lot of our schools in southern Maine, we've tried to, to um, provide an opportunity for our student athletes, um, uh, a, a competitive schedule, uh, and um, the amount of competitions that would be, um, I think, sufficient to allow students to study, but also compete and get the, the benefits of, of participating in athletics. Um, the, I think a result of a lot of this the discussion has been students deciding if they're going to be impacted in such a way um, that there is potential for them to not participate at the high school level but participate outside of their teams. And, and that's kind of scary because I think what we can provide um, our student athletes, the lessons um, and, the, and the guidance that we have as high schools that can that we have to oversee and to, to lead our student athletes is a little different than some of what our outside programs may have to offer or lack thereof sometimes. Um, so that, that's a little scary. That's, that would be a, a number one concern of mine would, would be to lose that ability to help guide our, our, athlete, our young people. And I think um, at the high school level, we do have uh, the availability to, to provide that kind of guidance. So that would be a that would be a definite loss. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, Jeff, is this number that you've given us here? Is this a potential savings number based on the recommendations? That yeah. That, so, for, for instance, if if they were to um, look at um, reducing the number of weeks, number of days, uh, games and a 50% playoff, so I, what I did was I sort of put it into a preseason, regular season, and playoff perspective. Mm -hmm. So I looked at coaches stipends and uh, officials and travel uh, for each season, and um, those, fi those figures would be a savings. Thank you, I, that's, I thought that's what you meant, I just wanted to be yeah, clear. Yeah, they would, or that's the cost of to run those programs. Great. Anyone else? I have questions, but I want to give everyone else the opportunity. All right, a couple questions. Um, the, uh, this ad hoc committee, could you explain the process? Uh, I guess the reason why, I, I'm concerned about what Karen's comment is, and I'm specifically, I'm a little concerned about the way they've done this, because I'm speaking from personal experience. I have children that run cross country and indoor track, and those teams perhaps are going to be decimated at the high school. Um, is, it, is my impression similar to this 10% cut that we've heard about? It seems to me like a hammer. Let's cut all the sports by one competition. Is there any sense or movement to look at individual sports and what these cuts will have on the individual sports schedules? That's my first question. Second, who is making up this ad hoc committee? I'm hearing rumors that there's representation from some of the smaller class, class C and B and not A and B representation. I don't know if that's true or just rumor. Um, they're voting January 26th. What, I know you're a principal, Jeff, and I don't know, I mean, what is the process for either school boards, students, coaches, people to comment on these. I understand it's being driven by cost savings and we have to make difficult decisions. You know, I'm also hearing that there's restrictions that, you know, districts all across the board, again, the hammer approach, none of you can participate. And I think these types of opportunities, I'm a little alarmed about the French exam being cut. It seems like we're whittling away at opportunities that differentiate our kids when they're going to apply to colleges. And if we take all of those opportunities away, it, all of our kids eventually get to be seniors, and they're all eventually going to be in this application pool. It seems to me that this might have more disastrous compli 
implications or intended un unintended consequences? Um, I would agree 100 percent. There's no question about it. And essentially, I think the, the ad hoc committee that was formed, um, I'm not sure how that process works and how um, the Maine Principals Association, Association chose to um, pick these people, but there are middle school uh, principals to high school principals, um, elementary school principals, um, maybe a, a few athletic administrators. Um, the, that ad hoc committee, the recommendation, that is a public um, document, and I do, have, I do have a copy of that, and I'd be more than happy to uh, send that to the, to the school board uh, um, tomorrow morning, and uh, just so you can see who's on that committee. Um, there is some Southern Maine representation on there. I think uh, the Cumberland County representation is a little thin, um, and it's probably our, the largest portion, proportionally, uh, with our with our student with our um, students participating in athletics. So it's 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 unfortunate that um, we weren't represented quite as well there. Um, but some of the recommendations from speaking with other athletic administrators has been to send letters to the Maine Principals Association, at least sharing um, our opinions um, from an athletic administrator and principals. Um, and one of our goals in this meeting on Friday will be to, as a conference as well, show our unity and show our, um, some of, and share our opinions with, with the MPA as well. Um, one thing I had, our, I had here on my end, uh, I sent this out to our coaches, received a ton of, and I sent it out to actually our coaches um, and our booster groups. And so I've received some excellent information, compiled that data, and um, sort of sent my uh, person, you know, our, or Cape Elizabeth's uh, perspective on um, how this would impact our student athletes. And from, from our coaches' perspective, from our boosters' insight, um, and uh, some parents as well that had some really, really uh, excellent thoughts on, on how this would impact, especially at the, with, the, with the New England participation. I think that's, that was, a, that was a, an area that sometimes it's a small amount of students that participate in that, and um, that would be easily overlooked, I think, if, if uh, we didn't address it. So um, those are some of the ways that we're trying to address and handle it on our end, I think. Um, it, um, and, and speaking with a lot of athletic administrators, I I'm, I'm really haven't had a strong sense of how this is going to proceed. Some half of them feel that it's a done deal that these recommendations are going to go into place, and others believe that uh, I'd say the other 50 percent definitely believe it's not going to happen or, or will happen. So um, there's not really that I'm not really getting a good sense from um, my colleagues as to where this is going to go. It's, it's really, and I think that's part of why we're all hearing sort of these rumors, but uh, um, it, is the, it is an interscholastic committee that is uh, formed by the Maine Principals Association that will be determining this decision. Um, I find it a rather interesting process. So I would plead with the principals who have a vote in that organization with 70 plus and upwards of 90 percent of our students involved in athletics, this could have a real impact. I, I think it's a rather interesting process where they're, I'm glad to hear that you're sharing some of the votes and I would just plead with our principals and their votes. <laughs> any other I, questions or comments? I have comments? a question for you, Trish, because as one who does not have any students in middle school or high school, uh, which of these in particular would devastate the Track. I'm just well. Just some in the some of it when it's they're in the nature of the track is sort of an individual sport, and there aren't a lot of. It's not like basketball where they have like two games a week per se. So, it, the percentage. If you take one yeah. meet out, it's a greater percentage. Plus the kids that, that run cross country, for example, they're really competing against themselves. So the individual, like the New England meets, it, those are the competitions they need. I mean, that's just what I'm hearing from the kids and the coaches. Uh, that's very helpful. And I didn't mean to make it personal. I just, it, I, I don't, I read about it in the newspaper and was kind of shocked. I understand why, but to me it seems like it's a real hammer approach with not the sensitivity to the individual nature of the, of the 
program. And I think having our meeting last week, and not to, to uh, belabor this a little bit, but having that meeting with the um, SMA last week was, was critical, and I wish uh, we had done it probably sooner um, as opposed to more of a reactionary type thing right now. But um, those were the things that we were looking at, ways of combining. You know, I think looking at something like New England's, we should be having one bus from a number of different communities and sending them t together and represent me. You know, I think it brings the schools together and it's a way of showing, that, and that's just one example, and it's a way of showing, that's a great um, you know, just some simple things like that. And um, it's unfortunate that, as you said, the hammer approach has sort of um, been put in place or potentially maybe put in place instead of some more creative thinking. And, uh, and uh, I hope we could maybe possibly delay this decision and with some of this new information that we've been sharing, um, maybe that, you know, I could keep, only keep our fingers crossed, but uh, um, it's, a, it's definitely a it's concern. Vinda, yeah. What's the level of um, the Western Maine Conference, what's the level of their influence over these decisions that are going to be made? I mean, looking at the number of students involved in athletics in this particular conference must reflect, I would think, close to the majority of the state. Um, yeah, it's a large number, especially looking with this, the SMA schools, the larger public schools in, in the Cumberland County area. Um, they certainly make up a large portion of the, the population. Um, but Maine Principal Association sort of represents the state of Maine um, as well. So I think it's a, um, you know, I think their approach is coming at it from an equitable standpoint, um, and it may not necessarily be equitable to our student athletes in southern Maine. Um, it may help student athletes in northern Maine, um, but I think it puts our, our young people in a severe disadvantage down here. And I don't know if the, um, the Sports Done Right group, and I'm not talking about our group here in Cape Elizabeth, but the main leadership team that came together, which was comprised of, I want to say, some senators and John Benoit and some, you know, very influential people in the state. I, I wonder how they're responding to all of this and if they've had an opportunity to express any concerns. And I don't know if that's a question yeah, or an I answer, but it seems odd that there wouldn't be some conversation with a group that worked so hard for the entire state of Maine to perhaps get their feedback. Yeah. I haven't, personally, I haven't heard anything um, coming from that organization, but uh, again, playing devil's advocate a little bit, I think it's hard, it may be hard for a group like that to make a decision and come out publicly because of how the impacts on some of these northern Maine communities. Um, and I think the MPA is trying to come down on a, an equitable basis and trying to um, support not only our southern community, but also the nor northern part of the state as well. And that, like I said, I think it's really a difficult situation because it r puts our young people definitely in a situation where um, we have a lot more opportunity for our kids to choose um, some outside programs. I think that's the direction where a lot of our kids may go if, if something like this happens. So, um, as opposed to in northern Maine where they may just have a high school program or can I just add a couple of things? Yeah. Um, it, it is a really unusual process at this point. In fact, we're not, I mean, I'm not getting a lot of information. In fact, until I spoke to Jeff about 10 days ago or so and began to see the newspaper, I was under the impression that they were really talking about a decision to be made in effective next year. The reason for the speed is they are really talking about a decision that could affect the spring season, um, the mm -hmm. spring season and beyond. Um, so that's, that's why they're putting things in, trying to put things in place so quickly. I guess I wonder whether or not, in light of the fact that energy prices, which I think was a driving force initially behind all this, have come down considerably, whether there's a way to sort of slow this, slow this down so there's some more considered reflection. I will also say for the, for the young people, and this is for Andrew and Sarah in particular, this is the, the nature of the MPA voting process is that although you know, if you add up the SMAA schools and the WMC schools and look at that, um, 
every school is, e is, is the same. In other words, P Portland High School principal gets one vote. Um, um, I think there's a Holton High School gets one vote. Um, and it isn't necessarily proportionate. You know, I reacted to your question, Linda, in terms of the, how influential are the schools. Well, every school in the state has the same influence on this decision. And I think the driving force is not so much southern Maine as it is central and northern, where legitimately the transportation expenses are proportionally greater because the schools are farther apart. So it's going to be stay tuned for everybody. I have begun to receive some correspondence from parents as well, particularly about the New England yeah. issue. Thank you both, Jeff, for your yeah. work on that. Um, and I guess we'll stay tuned. Um, Drummond and Woodson Conference. No speech about that. Sure. I'll probably forget something so you can fill it in. Um, Alan, Pauline, and I went to Drummond and Woodson Conference in Augusta on the other day, uh, Thursday of last week. And they did a nice um, job, and I brought back uh, booklets for the board and put them in your mailboxes. They did a nice job at talking to a huge number of people about the budget crisis and some of the items that people would be looking at. Um, some things to consider when looking at different items. Um, um, I found it very helpful. It was uh, amazing the number of good questions that came from the people in the room. What was really sad was the people who are consolidating and the things that they have to consider above and beyond the budget issues because as they consolidate, <coughs> somewhat like unfunded mandates, they have to do things like change accounts, change busing, change lettering, change letterheads all kinds of um, expenses that they're incurring but now have no money to um, pay for it. A lot of discussion about people who'd, done, who'd had layoffs, um, how layoffs were done, what to consider, what not to consider, um, and some ideas I think that, and it's in the booklet, some ideas that I, I think maybe we hadn't thought about before we went up there. So it was very helpful <coughs> to have a panel of I think five attorneys there and each one of them did a little presentation and were available for questions. I think they had about a half hour, 45 minutes of questions at the end. So um, it was great because I, I, for me, it gave me some things to think about um, and to, to, you know, to feed back to the board um, as we look at the budget process. So you wanna? Yeah, I, I think uh, Kathy has really covered it quite well. I, I think what becomes very clear is the questions you were just asking about athletics we ask the same thing about from the state level. What is happening? Where are the influences? You talk with legislators, it's the same thing, that even though you're from Cumberland County, which is probably the largest county, uh, that there is, there is a, in quotation marks, equity that they try to make for all of them. And so in listening on last uh, Thursday, it was very clear to us, we are struggling, I feel, in developing a budget here in Cape Elizabeth. But then as I listened to others, I thought, I don't even know where they are beginning to look at two and three and four million dollars worth of cuts and how they're going to do it. But it, is, it was valuable in that they looked at issues that we had not even thought about before uh, and how we would deal with those. And those are in your booklet and there are some of those things that we're thinking about now as we, as we work our way through that process. I could just ask, answer, uh, add one more thing. I was, um, I had to give um, credit to our Alan and our system, though, because there was a lot of things where they say, "Well, now you need to consider this," and I'm checking off, "Done that." Need to consider that, done that. So there was a whole bunch of things that we had already done, we had in place, we had already addressed, and there were people sitting next to us going, "Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, they're writing this thing." So things they hadn't even thought about, but that Alan and his staff had already put in place. So. There was a little bit of me that said we're a tiny bit luckier than some of the people in that room that were nearly panicked. And they came from everywhere, Holton, um, all over the state. There, like, there were several hundred people in that room, and the driving was bad. I guess some people had gone off the road on the way to get there, but they got there because you know, they didn't want to miss out on this seminar. So. Well, thank you, Kathy, Alan, and Pauline for attending that and sharing the information with us. Um, Okay, um, new business, consideration and action to approve high school athletic fee position. And I have one, and that is from Mary Ellen Town for volleyball. Uh, it's a $1,000 stipend and it is paid by the Booster Club. Um, I have a motion. 
I'd like to <clears throat> I'd like to move to recommend Mary Ellen Toll's stipend position for volleyball as recommended by um, Alan, the superintendent. Uh, second. 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 Thank you, Kathy. All those in favor. I have a question. Yep. Sure. Um, is it new hire or not? Actually, it happened. This is a, an okay, approval. Is, it a, is she a new hire or not? She was, uh, she's a, she has been working with Perkins as a volunteer, but the boosters were able to come up with some money to pay her. So I think on the back of that, there's a. Yes. Mm -hmm. a Jack and explanation. Right. Okay. I, I just don't, do we then require a uh, brief description of qualifications if it's a new hire or not for something that's paid by a booster? We can do that. We can get that. I don't have it. No. I don't want to make a big deal of it, but we have been trying to remain consistent in how we go through the hiring process. So I just happened to notice that there was no N or dot Y there. And just thought I'd bring it up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, consideration and action to approve the middle school athletic fee position. And I also have one here. This is Tom Cohen for boys expansion basketball. He's a coach three with 120 hours, rate of 1560. Uh, this is a new position. And this is not a new position. This is uh, and not a new hire. Um, is there a motion to approve this middle school athletic fee position? So moved. Thank you, Kathy. Second. Sec second. Thank you, Linda. Any comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor? Thank you. Um, consideration and action to accept a transfer of up to $200,000 from the town's undesignated surplus fund to the school's undesignated surplus fund. Can I address this before we take a motion? Sure. Um, I just wanted to update the board on um, what I learned about last, last night's town council meeting. Um, the town council did vote 4-2 last night um, in reference to that item, and on, in their agenda it was item 30-2009, school board curtailment. And they voted um, to, rec um, to authorize a transfer of up to $200,000 from the town undesignated surplus to the school undesignated surplus. However, the transfer amount will not be more than 50% of the amount of the GPA curtailment amount for the school year 2008 2009. I just wanted to put that in so that you knew that they had voted in favor of it before we voted. Thank you, Thank Kathy. You. Um, do I have a motion on this item? I move that we approve, um, <coughs> accept a transfer of up to $200,000 from the town's undesignated surplus fund to the school's undesignated surplus fund. Um, and that it will not be more than 50% of the amount of the GPA curtailment amount for school year 2008-2009. Thank you, Rebecca. Second? Second. Okay. Any questions or comments? Um, seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. All right. Consideration to authorize the superintendent to expend the balance of the 2002-2008 bond. Yeah, could I speak to that also? Yeah. Sorry. I just got this information before the meeting, so otherwise Thank I would. Um, the town council also um, voted on the bond, um, the leftover from the bond last night. And um, one of the items that we should be aware of is that they voted to um, give the school board full flexibility to direct the leftover dollar amount that was designated towards the school of 73,821, um, and they were unaware of what may still be a, a pending for bills, um, and I think Alan can speak to that. Okay. And, and so we are at this point in time in the process of checking billing, uh, specifically around the uh, addition of lockings on the internal doors for the emergency plan. Uh, that is one of the major ones that we're, we still need to finalize. And also, we have an issue which we are looking at now, in that we purchased through that process cameras for the buildings. And at that point in time, the police department 
did a grant proposal to buy a server for those uh, cameras, and that grant did not pass. So therefore, we have 60 cameras. We have 30 hooked up. Uh, 30 are pushing the server we have now. So we do need to look at another server. And I've already spoke, I had already spoken to Mike about this issue as we're working our way through. So the two major issues that we have still is the completion of the doors and also the server. And then we would, would look at uh, these monies to do other uh, parts of the needs of the buildings, including roofing and uh, uh, other pieces that may need to be needed at that point. And I will have a report to you as soon as we have those pieces taken care of. Can I ask Kathy a question? Yes. Um, because I was not at that meeting. Did they go ahead and decide to go forward with the town center sidewalk for 363000 and the school parking lots and Route 77 paving for 410000 and the preservation of the Spur Week meeting house for 397000 They, um, to the best of, from my notes, um, they did vote to repair the church. They did vote to finish the bleacher payment. I believe it's the bleacher payment. Um, they voted um, to finish some green, green belt projects that they had already started and committed to. They did uh, vote for road and parking lot um, repavements. And I believe Alan is talking with Mike on some of that. And the, what they did do is they froze $3,000 the amount, uh, $300,000 of the amount, which was for the, uh, the uh, Sidewalk, which would lead from the high school down to Fowler Road, and so they've frozen that. They froze that. Okay. And so that that money will be available uh, for other issues that we need that needed to be done by the school or by the town, uh, as far as uh, capital improvements. Okay. Did I answer all of your questions? I think you did. Okay. Thank you. So, Alan, you're still looking for us to. Um, you need authorization from the board to yes. expend the bond proceeds, remaining bond proceeds for these items you've mentioned and other. Facilities. Okay. Um, I move that we authorize the superintendent to expend the balance of the 2007 2008 bond. Thank you, Rebecca. A second? A second. second. We'll give me a your time. Okay. Um, we just had some information, but are there any questions or comments? Rebecca? I just have one shared observation from the Pond Cove building today. I noticed uh, a um, stain in the ceiling tile that not only was brown from obviously some leak at some point, but it seems to have started to turn black. And where in the pond hole was it? It's um, right at the L, so when you, before you get to the fourth grade wing, it's where the blackboards are and the whiteboards are. It's not that big, but I just want to share that with the board me know that. and the public because the longer we delay these roofing repairs, the bigger the problem we are going to be facing. And the fact that there's now mold growing in our schools is a big concern for me. Oh, I'm raising my own hand. Trish? <laughs> 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 my first meeting, excuse my <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I've made a long way without making a mistake thus far, because I didn't recognize you, so Great. thank you for bearing with me. Um, on that note, we do have the middle school repair, yep. and I guess I turn it to you, Alan, and the other administrators. It, it, I'm, obviously, we're in triage, and there's a matter of priority. I understand the cameras are important, but is a roof more important? I, and, I don't know. I tossed that out on Rebecca. The middle school is staying, is staying right at the head of our important list, and it is from both the perspective of the bond money, but now in learning about the $300,000 and that we can go into that to try to get those done. And now hearing Rebecca, I need to go back and take a look at that as well and see where we are and what we need to be done there. So I've made a note to uh, also take a look at that piece. But that, that, that's not going to be lost. That is saying at the head of our list. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, we're moving on to policies. Are you up, Rebecca? I am. I am. Okay, everybody, I'm stepping in some, some really big policy shoes here, so bear with me. Um, okay, so this evening we are voting to approve for second reading 
Policy JIB student involvement in decision making, JLCB school immunization policy, and BIA new board member orientation. Um, I don't, these were all had a first reading. There were no additional um, changes or suggestions. So I would like to move that we approve these three policies. Second. Thank you, Linda. Any questions? Four comments for Rebecca. Just one comment. Awesome. <laughs> All those in favor? Thank you. Okay, and uh, also for this evening, we, oh, I'm just kind of moving on. Is that okay, Trish? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, policies for first reading is policy EFI, food service records and reports. Um, EFI, there were just several edits made to clarify the role of the Food Services Director and there's going to be a cross-reference with the job description. Um, policy EI, Insurance Management. Um, you're with me. We changed the legal reference as uh, indicated by Drummond and Woodsum. JHCA, Use of Unscheduled Class Time for High School Seniors. Um, there are just some minor edits to that from the previous um, edition of this. JLCCA, AIDS HIV attendance policy. Um, this would have just had some edits provided by Drummond and Woodsum. There have been no changes to the law, so um, the board agreed that there were no other edits required. So these are the policies that we're having for the first reading. If you have any questions, <coughs> I'm happy to take them now, or you can uh, attend our meeting or email me. I'll bring them to our um, policy committee meeting. Any questions or comments for Rebecca right now? Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Um, consideration and action to approve the PATHS budget. Is this you, Kathy? Yep. Um, I should fill in the details on the PATHS budget first so you know what you're voting on. That would take all the fun out of it. Um, we met, the PATHS committee met on Thursday, December 11th to vote on the budget. We had actually met prior to that and um, it was an interesting meeting. Then you had a room full of superintendents. The PATHS folks had brought forward a budget. There's a part one and there's a part two. Part one we do not vote on. It's not under our control, but part two is. And part two has to do more with um, items um, for their different programs, like um, compressors and paint and so forth, or paint sprayers and um, clean rooms. And at that first meeting, I'd say just about every superintendent in the room said, go back and bring us back like a near zero budget. And so we had another meeting, which was on December 11th, and they brought us back an initial budget um, of $102,444.10, which was to be um, shared with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 districts, districts that send kids to their program. And that vote was taken and it failed. Um, and after much discussion and two additional votes, we finally voted to approve a budget of $42,244, which was passed unanimously. The cost of that for 2009-2010 for Cape Elizabeth is $659.52, which is a reduction from this year of $3,452.48. So we also need to vote to approve or disapprove that number of 659.52 for um, part two of the PATHS budget. And we currently have, before you ask, we currently have an average of nine and a half students attending. And I say that because what they do is they take um, our October 06 figure and our October 07 figure to decide, to, to determine what our share is. In October 06, we had nine students. In October 07, we had 10. So now we have nine and a half. Um, so, and that, so that's how they figure out our percentage. They take a two-year average. 
So anyway, the, the number to be voted on is 659.52. So I would like to move that we um, vote to um, approve the PATHS Part 2 budget for 2009-10 of $659.52. A second? Second. Rebecca, any questions or comments for Kathy? I have a question. Yeah. Oh, did you raise your hand? I didn't raise my hand, so. I'm a question for Kathy or Alan. I don't have any answer. Um, goodness. Just out of curiosity, Yarmouth is a smaller school district, but they have about twice as many kids taking advantage of PATH. Is there an explanation for why there's that discrepancy? I mean, why they have, is it just the demographics or is it, you know, perhaps we're not taking advantage of it as much? Like anything else that I need to be aware of why those numbers are so I, from, from my perspective, anyway, it is totally interest. It is totally interest in what programs they want to participate okay. in. And so I think that's why you'll find the difference. I think you'll find that a majority of Cape Elizabeth students prefer, is prefer a fair word, to remain in our school and get the programs they need. Okay. Uh, but uh, so that you will see a discrepancy here among schools like a Yarmouth, which is very much the same size as ours. But it's totally by choice. And actually, would that have been a question for you too, Dom, or not? Is this t totally separate from, no, you don't have to come up and answer it. I mean, he, he probably just answered it, but I mean, this sort of falls under your jurisdiction or not? No. Not at all. It's just totally separate. separate. Okay. Uh, I have one, well, anybody else, I should say. Anyone else have a question, uh, Rebecca? I just want to um, clarify that while we just voted on $659, that is not the cost to the district. That's right. Uh, that our total, Actually, I'm not going to, well, uh, roughly our total cost is $47,000 for 2009 to 2010. Thank you for mentioning that. Maybe you want to. And that was, that was one of the things I was just going to mention. Just so that you understand, there is a part one and a part two budget. By state law, the part one budget is determined by your population that it shows here, which is the comparison of 10-6 and 10-7 so that we are committed at that, that point in time to pay that 45582 Several people asked me the question of, can we get that amount smaller? And I asked that question at that meeting, and we can't because it is a commitment for two years down the road. If Cape Elizabeth at some point decides they would like to drop out of PATH programming, then we would have to make that decision early enough so that it can be changed over that next two year period. So if you look at the law, when vocational school law was passed, which was originally vocational school law, is that part one is, co is your commitment for the, based on your populations for the next two years. And then part two is that part for equipment, et cetera, that is needed to enhance programs. Part two can also be, if they're adding a new program that we've all voted in favor of, then we also share the cost of that program. This year, there was no new program added, so therefore our cost did not go up. So if you look down this, you will see that we are the, uh, have the smallest number of students who attend, with Falmouth being the next smallest. And then it ranges from there up through to Portland and South Portland. So, uh, so just so you do know, and Rebecca is absolutely right, that was my next point, is the total budget that we're looking for is the combination of 45,582 and 65952, which will be in our budget this year. Anybody else? I'm, I'm just curious to know if all the other districts are going through what we're going through, and if, if it results, the budgets result in um, programs being cut, reduced, whatever, in district area schools, and such that the effect might be that more students participated paths. I mean, paths to some extent is a resource. It, does that adjust our assessment? Can paths respond to an increased number of students? I mean, I know there are logistical Next challenges year. for our kids getting there, but if, and I don't even have an example to use, but, you know, if more of our kids choose to go there because we can't offer the programs or Falmouth can't offer the programs, a Yarmouth can, this almost seems to me like this, we should, they should be doing their budget sort of in tandem with us because they're a joint resource for all these communities and maybe if we or Falmouth or Yarmouth have to cut something, maybe they can add it more cost efficiently if you sort of take that whole regional approach and or what does that do to our assessment 
if instead of nine kids that we're budgeting for, we have 20 kids that go there, and that's the best way we can educate them and insulate them from this loss that we're talking about as we <coughs> proceed through the budget process. And I think your question uh, really relates back to the changes that have happened between the vocational schools of the 80s and where we are today. And basically, the way I'm understanding it, because I asked a lot of questions about this at the meeting we were at, and I was one of them who led the no vote in doing this because they had a, an enormous uh, amount of money that ha was not included in the budget, and I couldn't believe that they did that. My understanding is, if we have a larger number of students who wish to attend because of a change, like for instance, I'll say this and I'll get in trouble for it, I know, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Let us suppose that we've cut had to cut a art program and there is a very an excellent art program at pass now most students will opt not to do that because it involves traveling over traveling back and all the pieces to the puzzle but if we had students who wanted to do that what we would have to do is go to pass make the application for that and our students would be allowed in based on the room within the classes and most of their classes are full not so 10 years ago. 10 years ago, they were all begging for students. So we could make that, that proposal. Then what we would do is renegotiate our numbers for the next year in order to do it. So we couldn't make that decision overnight. We couldn't decide, okay, we're gonna cut an art program, therefore our kids are going to have to go to the art program at PADS, and we can do that tomorrow. It, will, it has to be a long-term planning process in order to do that, to get the, uh, get the priority to do that. But in terms of when kids sign up at the high school, does that timing work, Jeff? <laughs> I don't think that our normal timing for signing up for classes would be an obstacle to more students deciding to go to PADS, but I think what Alan is getting at is just as we have you know, limited staff and limited numbers and, and sort of caps on particular courses because of safety considerations or just equipment considerations or whatever, there's no guarantee that because our kids sign up to take it that they will necessarily get into the program of their choice. So I guess I would urge Thank you, if I understand it. I guess I would urge, given the budget situation that so many communities are in, that this might be a way to creatively provide programs that might otherwise be cut in communities. And I don't, I guess I would, I don't know how to do that if we can sort of request that PATH do some thinking about that. I understand what you're saying long term, and that says to me then, if 20 kids wanna go, 20 kids may not be able to be accommodated there. And that says, if we do have to make these difficult cuts, we're still not meeting the needs of those kids when conceptually there are resources available to them. And I guess my other question was, are these com conversations, how do you have these conversations? Like, just for example, we play this out, and I'm just using your art example. If other districts have to cut an art class, you've got art spaces. And it would probably be, is there any thought to um, instead of our kids going all the way over to PADS, could South Portland, Scarborough, and Cape Elizabeth, for example, have an instructor from PADS come and use our art room? I mean, I know that's really out of the box, three steps down, but I think we need to start to be thinking about that. We really want to deliver the education to our kids, and if some of the problem is getting them over there, and we all want to provide them with the opportunities for art instruction, how do we start to have that conversation? I, I would, I, I'll take part of it and, and you can too, Jeff. I, I think what you're going to find is, uh, going back to what the other Jeff said a few minutes ago, when Kathy and I went to the meeting a month ago, I think it was pretty obvious that people at PADS did not realize the situation that most of us are in at that point in time and were quite taken back when uh, some of us refused to pass their budget. I use that as an example because then what happens is PADS has a monthly meeting and it's called the GAC meeting where the superintendents and members of the board of each town meet and talk about regulations and planning, et cetera. Uh, I know those people over there well enough to know that that suddenly has been an issue that has been running through their heads and so I know they are beginning to take a look at how would that look 
And the, the key to all of that is, and I, I can talk about it also from Bath Regional Vocational, which I was on the board of when I was in Wiscasset, is that there are very strict laws passed by the state that you have to follow in order to take each step of that process. So they will be, I'm sure they are going to be looking at them. Uh, I will speak to it from the perspective of a parent. Uh, I, had kid, I had two daughters who went through another high school near here. I would have loved to have had them take the art programs at Pass. But because of the level of courses they were taking, like I look at these two students here, their ability to take those is very, very difficult. The other question you asked, and it's an interesting question because I had done this discussion with Bath at, the, at that point in time. The question of can we move some programs from a vocational type school into a more central location to be offered by a couple of schools there, to a couple of schools there. Like could you move an art program to Cape Elizabeth where South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and let's say Scarborough could attend it? That's an issue we have not discussed here, but I, it will be an issue that will be coming up because all of us, don't care who it is who's in public education right now, is looking at getting out of the box and what we need to do as we move along. I, I, Jeff, I, I don't know if you have an other I, I don't think I, I don't think I have anything real, really to add to that. I mean, I think that you know, the creative discussions are what Alan was talking about at the end is more um, Scarborough, South Portland, Cape talking about courses that we want to offer. I think the difficulty for PADS getting involved in that discussion is that to the extent, I mean, we could offer, if we had open space, we could offer our, our space, but my guess is we'd be one of the last schools um, that send kids to PADS that, ki that they would want to use only because we send a very small number of students. They'd probably be much more likely to look, at, and we're not just not centrally located. Um, they'd probably be more likely to look at space in Deering or Portland High School or some of the other things that are much more centrally located. But it's a great, it's a, it's a great question, and I think the corollary of it, of you know, of schools facing common cuts, sort of planning together, if there's a way that we can do that. Um, I had uh, I had an individual talk to me the other day about the possibility of Southern Maine Community College. Um, allowing kids from Southern Community, Maine Community College coming to some of the Cape Elizabeth High School things if we had openings in some of our classes or um, using some of our facilities and that. So there's a lot of creative ideas that the budget sort of mess is beginning to bubble to the surface. Um, we have to take some time to look at them. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions on the PATHS budget and related topics? Okay, um, all those in favor of approving the PATH budget as presented? <coughs> Thank you. Um, consideration and action to approve the school nurse job description. Linda? Yeah, uh, the personnel committee worked with Alan and the nursing staff and administrators to develop a new job description as presented in the packets tonight. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the nurse job description as presented. Um, is there a second? Second. Rebecca and Linda. Any questions or comments for Linda? Can I ask a question? It's, it's a sure. four-page job description. And I'm thinking that some of our other job descriptions maybe aren't quite so long. And I'm just sort of trying to mull around in my head um, why this one stands out as being longer, unless I'm missing something. I believe we, well, I was going to say, I, I do know that we kind of um, brought this up uh, during our personnel meeting. One of it is, is we were trying to get as descriptive as possible, um, going from a nothing uh, job description to this. Uh, I know, and I'd like to. And, so, and specifically what we did was, uh, we've also done the same thing with guidance, is we looked at what is required from the state level and the requirements from the state level as far as nursing goes are fairly comprehensive. And so when they built this, they looked at nursing uh, job descriptions from several districts within Cumberland County and uh, worked on that to be sure they had covered all of the pieces to the puzzle. And so that's why it has become longer. And you would see most of them because if you read down through them, many of them do fit 
uh, the legal requirements that they have as far as meeting nursing uh, instruction. Thank you. Anybody else? No wonder why we have a nursing shortage. Well, that's, no, I was just going to comment on that. Every, given the nursing shortage, um, does something like this pose an impediment to finding someone to work in our schools? We had the discussion. The nurses uh, sat down and did this and looked it up and, and worked their way through it. And their feeling to me when they presented it to me was that this is, is very logical. These are the things we need to do in order to protect our school system and in order to be sure we're providing the right programs. I agree with you. It's uh, We don't pay nurses like a hospital pays a nurse or private practice, but their feeling was uh, that this fit, and we, we've had, I think I've had four renditions of this as we've worked our way through it, and they've looked at it carefully. And just for clarification again, because I know you're lo looking at a limited job pool, I know we had heard difficulties finding substitutes a couple years ago, probably still now. Are these education and certification requirements um, law? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can I add one comment too? I think sure. one of the things that this makes me think about is what came up at that Sugarloaf conference that um, several people from the Wellness Committee um, went to, and that is a move in our state towards funding school health coordinators. And currently, there are like 30 or 40 being funded by using state funds to sort of use as a model and see how that plays out given some of the new wellness mandates and other things that are beginning to occur, but also someone that can pull a lot of this stuff together, not just the nurses, but, but health educators and everything. So you, we might be seeing more of that and that would hopefully ease some of the burden that's upon some of these nurses. And, and I think I'm glad you mentioned that because another piece that goes with it goes back to Rebecca's comments earlier on funded mandates. Uh, I just went over with the nurses the unfunded mandates that Barbara Cummings has to do in order to keep us legal. And that list is one page long now of all of the different things that have to be done. So, you know, when we have these nurses, on top of that, we do have all of these mandates that we have to meet. And uh, the list grows constantly there. I, th I think there were two or three new ones for this year that had not been on before that are unfunded mandates from the state. So. Any other questions or comments on the job description? All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Linda and the Personnel Committee, for working on that. Um, consideration to appoint a committee for future contract negotiations with the Cape Elizabeth Education Administrators Association. Um, and I think on that one, based on um, feedback or responses that I had from people, I'd like to move that Kathy Ray and Peter Cotter um, be our the negotiating team with the observer of um, Mary Townsend functioning as an observer with the administrator's um, agreement on that. I think that's how it has to be ordered. Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, any questions or comments? Kathy? No question or no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Thank you. Um, lastly, consideration to approve direct communication with all CEA EA members through the President Executive Committee concerning the financial implications of the current contractual agreements and the development of the FY 2010 school budget. Any questions, comments, motion on this topic? So moved. Okay, so you're moving it as? Moving it as you stated. As is stated. Okay. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Any comments or questions? I'm, I, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, I didn't raise my hand. You yeah. did. I have a couple questions. I guess um, I looked at this uh, motion a couple of times. And number one, I guess I would like a little bit of clarification. Exactly what are we looking for? Whoever wrote the motion. Ex can you give me some exact direction on what you're looking for, um, what you're hoping to accomplish? I, I, put, I put this motion in here. Okay. This has been revised several times over the last week. Uh, what we basically did is this is a motion to have a formal discussion with the President and Executive Committee of CEA around financial implications of the current budget. In other words, taking a look at uh, the financial implications in their contracts and see if we can come to some form of agreement uh, to offset the $1.1 million uh, overage that we have at this point in time. So 
Are you indicating here that you want to actually open the contract at this point in time to discuss specifics of the contract? Okay. Yeah. That's it for the moment. I, well, uh, it's sort of along the same lines. I was kind of confused. Um, it says consideration to approve direct communication. And so I thought it was kind of um, fuzzy as to what the motion really does. If the motion's made and it passes. What does that mean? And I'm not sure I understand what it means. I, th I think the question is, uh, and, and I, I, again, I know there's been a lot of discussion about it before it came to me. I, my understanding is that what we want to be able to do is to have discussions with the president of the association and the executive committee concerning the financial implications of our current contracts. Remember that doesn't include just one contract, but several contracts. Uh, and how, what understandings we want to have as that final <coughs> FY 2010 school budget is developed. Because the baseline that we know is that if we keep all staffing and programs the way they are currently configured, we, uh, based on contracts and based on agreements, that we will have a $1.1 million, uh, $1 million overage as far as what we need for finances, which therefore means that we are looking at programs and staffing. So what I'm looking for is those discussions and what we, what we might or might not be able to do. Uh, you have the right to ask the uh, Cape Elizabeth Education Association for this discussion. They have the right to uh, accept that or to refuse that at that point in time. So can I ask another question, a follow-up? So do we need a motion for those meetings to take place? I mean, we've already had a couple meetings, and so I'm, so I'm confused as to why we, we might We haven't had a meeting as a board. No, no, I know that. I know that. Um, and, and, but this doesn't ask for a meeting with the board. That's not what this motion says. For me personally, when this was written, again, avoiding opening up all kinds of contracts and all kinds of discussion was to allow a discussion with the uh, president of the association and with the executive committee about possible plans. Uh, what we might be able to do together or what we might not be able to do together. The re need for this uh, motion is questionable, but my understanding as this was brought to me when we did the planning for this was that there was a request that we have a motion in here in some way to discuss financial implications and where we all stand on that issue. So that's where we are. I, this was not my need to create something. This was a need that I was understanding that you wanted to have in here in order to have those discussions. That, that came from me because I have um, uh, concerns that a budget is being created um, by our superintendent and our district leadership team without all of the aspects of our costs being addressed in an open, forthright manner. And um, as was indicated this evening by Alan, that time is coming very quickly, and yet there hasn't really been a face-to-face -face discussion between the Executive Committee of the Education Association and um, any members of our board. And I really think that given the extraordinary situation that we are facing as a town, as a state, and a country, that we need to be able to come together and have that conversation and, and have a very clear understanding of what all the implications are and how we can move forward. If, and I don't see how a budget can be presented to us without that conversation having happened. So I think this was Alan's attempt to do that. I appreciate it. Um, and I would support it, but I've now kind of changed a few of the words. Yeah. And, and I, I think I would like to support Rebecca and, and what she just said in terms of, a, as a board member, I would like to be involved or be privy to some of these conversations instead of having two people meeting or whomever else has been involved, I don't know, because I really haven't heard that much about those conversations. I mean, I, I'm very curious to hear 
about what the teachers and our, all of the teachers, and everyone who's a member of the CEEA, you know, what they're thinking through these tough times. And I really haven't gotten, I mean, I've gotten, we've gotten a letter from you, Dwight, um, you know, that I've read and, and I understand, but it, I think that sometimes it behooves us to have more than just a letter that we read versus a conversation um, to get to some of the more, to really process some of the more difficult um, issues and challenges together. So I think we did that very well in our teacher contract negotiations and I'd like to sort of continue in that spirit. Um, I'm, anybody else before I, Kathy, you want to respond? Anybody else? I'm just wondering, sort of listening to all the comments, if um, I'm hearing a couple different things from a process standpoint, if now is the right time, the motion as it stands doesn't request a meeting between the board and the CEA. So unless the motion is amended to reflect that, to me, it, I go back to Kathy's question, this is actually only reinforcing the conversations that are currently taking place between the superintendent and the CEAA. And right now, the, we don't have a school board budget. So right now, what's happening is what should be happening. It's the budget being prepared by the DLT and the conversations between the CEAA and the superintendent and the information that's coming out of those meetings will be reflected in the budget that, that is then presented to the school board. Once the school board gets that, then we have lots of questions. And if we feel, how, depending on how the budget is, that we as a board then, with our superintendent, want to have go down some different roads because we're not happy with the way the budget looks, I'm wondering if, if that's not the time to specify the meeting. I disagree. I think that it's um, our job to make sure that the superintendent has all information in front of him to facilitate a budget process. And um, if that means that we need to say as a board that we, and I would actually amend, I did not really, I did not really focus on all the language specifically clearly. Um, I would actually amend it to say uh, consider um, consideration to approve direct communication between board chair, vice chair, superintendent, and the CEA members through their president, blah, blah, blah. I would specifically say that. Say that one more time? Yes. Would you okay, please? sorry. Consideration to approve direct communication between the uh, superintendent, board chair, uh, board and vice chair, chair and vice chair of the school board. Sorry, I'm, I'm very tired. Um, and the CEA members through their president and executive committee. I just think that we are, having gone through four budget processes, to delay this conversation any longer is um, not only not helpful, but probably um, dangerous, because um, we tend to get down a road and things get more and more complicated and uh, the more information we have at the beginning, I think the better for our administrators and for ourselves. Okay, other comments? Was first. Linda and then Kathy. Yeah. And I, I thought a lot about what Tricia said and more and more I, I really support that idea because, you know, right at this point in time, the superintendent is still in the process of developing his budget. And I do believe that right at this point in time, those conversations that are taking place between the superintendent and the CEA membership team are probably the most important conversations to get the budget process started. I mean, for us, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel for us to start to intervene at this point in time um, to direct those conversations the way the board wants to see the budget when it's presented to us may be a bit premature. But may I ask a question? May I just ask a yeah, question sure. as a follow-up to her? Sure. Alan, have you had a meeting with the CEEA Executive Committee? No. I, I was going to ask the same exact question. Or is it just right. with Dwight? With Dwight. Right. And, and, and so uh, there is yeah. no Let conversation. Let me clarify that. <laughs> I'm looking at Dwight. 
I have not had a meeting with the executive committee about the budget as such. I've had right. meetings with them, but not about that budget. Mm -hmm. And Just I would agree right. with Rebecca on that. I, I, that to me is a very different scenario than Alan sitting down with Dwight and the executive committee. Just as I would probably agree with Rebecca on the chair and the vice chair. Okay, take out the chair and the vice mm -hmm. chair. Alan and Dwight and the executive committee. Okay, hold that up because okay. I want you just a minute. And I want to go back to Kathy. You guys are challenging me here. Kathy, you had a comment on Linda. Well, I had a comment no. in general. I mean, right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's I, okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not what I was. Um, I agree with what uh, Trish and Linda said initially, is that I don't have a problem with the way the process works now, which is it's the superintendent's budget until he brings it to the school board. And the school board can do whatever they want with it at that point because it becomes our budget to um, approve, reject, hack up, don't hack up. Um, and I think it micromanages his process by having the school board step in now to say we want a meeting with so and so and such and such at about such and such time. I think there's ample opportunity for Alan and CEEA, which I always mess up, to have those discussions and I have every confidence that he's having those discussions um, where he feels appropriate. Um, so I won't be supporting that motion. Just so I just want to be clear with that. Okay. Karen? I guess how um, I think mine would, my addition, or not my, the clarification, actually, this motion has it currently exists. I would support keeping the rest of the school board or keeping the school board out of it but making sure that those meetings taking place are not just with Alan and the CEA president but, but just as it states here through their president and executive committee that the executive committee would be part of those conversations okay or at least one conversation with our okay Linda just wanted to add a comment that where we do have this forum this listening session coming up on the 21st, you know, encourage all the members of the CEA to attend that meeting and, and voice their opinions at that time because that would give us the opportunity to hear what they have to say. But I think it's a very different conversation they're going to have. Agree. Agree. And I, I think, I would think that Alan and Dwight would be very open to having them be part of those discussions. I mean, I don't see why you want to keep them out of that unless there's some reason I need to be aware of, of why you'd want to keep the executive committee out of those conversations. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Dwight. <laughs> and I'm not, I hope you realize it's not a personal attack. I'm just I'm trying to bring more people into these conversations so that there's more ownership of and, it. And this issue was raised several months ago at a board meeting requesting that Alan and the CEA have these conversations. And my impression is, is that it has that there have been discussions, but that perhaps it hasn't reached the level that would have facilitated a full um, exchange of information so Alan would know specifically what all of his options were. And I'm, 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 dis I'm disappointed by that fact. I, th I would think at this point in time that Alan would have all information at hand in order for him to be as far along in the process as he is. And so this was my attempt to, to prod, frankly, the two parties to come together and have some very much more specific forthright conversations. I don't really care how that conversation happens. I would really appreciate it if it would happen before the DLT and the staff well, frankly, they already have been made to make decisions and recommendations based on um, information that's not complete. And I would have hoped that they could have been in the situation where they would have had more of an understanding of what were, what were the various options. But that is not the case. I, would, I think that for the process to go through cleanly and efficiently, that the budget that Alan presents to us is truly reflective of all of the options that are available. And it may be, we just don't know that. Um, other questions or comments? I think I, I want to clarify. Do we have any other questions or comments on this topic before I've heard two different motions? Mary, do you want to? Do you have any thoughts you want to share? 
I just want to give you the opportunity if you have. I mean, I, it, I, I'm frankly surprised that we have to make a motion to have a conversation <laughs> at being a, a new member of the board. And I, I think it makes perfect sense to have this conversation and to have it sooner rather than later, um, given the extraordinary um, economic crisis that we're in. I, I just think everything's got to be out on the table and everyone's got to be willing to have an open dialogue. And um, so I support the motion. Go ahead, Ellen. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to ch pay, choose my words wisely. But I'm, I'm looking at Dwight down there. Dwight and I have had several very serious conversations, including one last Friday, if I'm not mistaken, about the issue and talking about the issue of uh, whether we, you, the e CEEA is interested in opening up discussions about changes in the pay scale and for um, benefits for next year. And when we left each other on Friday, and I, I looked at Dwight because he was there and he's perfectly welcome to tell me I'm wrong, but when we left on Friday, my understanding was that he was meeting with his executive board on Monday to have those discussions and that he would be back to me. He and I obviously have not had time to be back to each other because of other things that have been going on. Am I misrepresenting that Dwight at all? Hi, guys. Hi, Dwight. Not at all. I mean, we are uh, fully expecting to have um, discussions. We, I feel like Alan has done a wonderful job keeping us informed, <clears throat> and we have uh, done brainstorming. Uh, I met with the executive board yesterday, and we are ready to have any kind of discussions with Alan or whoever else wants to be there. So that's not an issue on our part. Whether you need a motion to do that uh, is your business, but um, we're expecting to have discussions. Um, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I guess we have a motion. Rebecca, do you want to clarify what your motion is? I need a minute. Okay. Um, and maybe during that minute we can think about if this information indicates conversations are happening, we've had two, two or three questions as to whether or not we need a motion to encourage those conversations to continue to happen. So I guess I toss that out. I guess we have to, according to Robert's rules, we have to vote on that motion that's there. If it was seconded. I don't it was know. seconded. I don't know what so so yes, I guess then. I don't know what the wording is. What it's I, the original wording that was that's on the agenda. Okay, that's the that was the motion that was made. I haven't amended it or anything like that. So, so the piece on board, she has superintendent and vice chair. You don't want on there then? Mm -hmm. I I did not officially amend okay. it. I was just thinking out loud as a way to possibly amend it, but I didn't okay. do it. And I would like to add one more comment. I think maybe my concern throughout these extraordinary times, if you will, it would. I think it would be unfortunate if we went through this budget process and the school board didn't have some type of conversation, dialogue, open forum with the faculty and staff in this district. I think it would be a, um, a lost opportunity to, I, I don't know how that would look and it might be difficult um, and you all might disagree. I just I feel like we've got our work cut out for us and to sometimes not communicate, I think that just leaves a lot of room for, um, I don't know if we're it, it sounds as if you are having productive conversations, Alan. I think that- I, I felt I was. I think that perhaps what is missing is that the board is, is in, in, in normal situations, when there are conversations such as these, there is typically board membership in that conversation. Um, and, it's, and it happens within contract negotiations. So I'm wondering, is there a way? It's a, maybe it does not need to be an official vote, but perhaps just a conversation that we're having now requesting that you um, include your chair and vice chair in these discussions so that the board is 
because at some point, if, if things go one way or the other, I don't know, the board may or may not be involved, and I think it would be helpful to have board members present at those conversations so they know how things evolve and within what context. Um, and we're not left all kind of dancing and tiptoeing around things that we're not too sure about. So if, I, you know, if we, don't, we don't need to have an official vote as long as we maybe agreed this evening just by conversation that your chair, the board chair and vice chair, one or the other or both are present for these conversations. Okay, so I guess first I will. And I would agree to withdraw this motion if, if we can agree on that. Any comments? Or I don't think it's going to help if then the board and the, I mean, the, the chair and the vice chair don't communicate to the rest of us because then I'm still completely uninformed about what's transpiring and the conversations that are taking place behind closed doors. So I would just like to be informed. I, I personally will tell you that I take my role seriously and I think part of my role is communication with the remain, rest of the board. I don't mm -hmm. want to speak for Linda, but I would hope that she felt the same way as okay. I think anyone would. I sort of felt when Kathy was in the role, she did that. So I personally will commit to you that I will share um, information that becomes available to us. Most definitely. Other questions or comments? Okay. Have you officially? Do we? Do I call a vote? Or are you officially withdrawing your motion? Is everybody kind of nodding their head to this concept? Is, is everybody comfortable with this conceptually? Alan, how do you feel about this? Uh, I'm fine. I think what I'm understanding is you're not going to have a vote. Right. But when I have next meetings with Dwight, I will have either the chair and vice chair or one or the other with me at that point in time, and they will report back to other members of the board. And perhaps the executive committee, if Dwight mm -hmm. would feel that's helpful. Yep. Dwight, not okay. to put you on the spot, but just to sort of bring the conversation to close, is that sort of okay with you? Uh, I'm, I'm more married. Um, <laughs> think, uh, Can we all come? <laughs> yeah, why not? So <laughs> I was going to say right. so that we have some board representation at these meetings, right. depending, you know, Without and that the rest of whomever that person is does their best to communicate the information that's appropriate um, to the rest of the board. Thank you. Okay. I, Thank I you. withdraw my motion. Okay. Um, any, any other comments or other motions on this particular topic, or is the topic closed? Okay. Um, committee reports. Is there anyone, as we've done in the past, um, we've tried to streamline this, is there any committee who feels they have something to share um, or report on that has not sort of made its way through the agenda in other capacities. I just have a question. I have not received a, the minutes from the Finance Committee meeting that I unfortunately missed due to illness. And I haven't done them yet. Okay, so do you mind if I just ask two questions that are, just, that are finan yeah. financially, of course. Duh. That they're about finance? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, probably Pauline might be able to just pop up. I one, Two questions that have just been bothering me. Um, one is the price of gasoline through the municipal supply has been extraordinarily high, apparently because we had such a large volume in storage. Have we gotten down? I mean, what's the story with the gas price that we're now being charged? Thank you. Um, and the community services pricing of, of um, activities, did, did, was there any sort of discussion around incorporating um, utilities? Janet, do you want to speak to that? Or you're probably, I, mean, I could 
I mean, are you prepared to do that? I could sort of. <laughs> Just like sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, we did that to Janet like her first night, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> the question being um, incorporating of utilities in what way? Well, so um, several months, ago, our first meeting, I believe, we were discussing the cost of energy and. Um, Alan and his team went through some very rigorous exercises about utilization of our buildings and how to, where we, how we would limit usage of the high school, et cetera, et cetera. Because we have such a large use of our facilities by non-school activities. Um, and one of the things that I would, was, would like to see is determining whether it makes sense or not to include in the cost that's, that uh, so an activity of 20 activity fee of $27 for dodgeball for four weeks does that include the cost of keeping that building open for that period of time electricity and um, heating wise and if it doesn't if we did would it make sense to do it I mean it could be a lot of work for nothing but I'm just wondering how much it might save the schools the <clears throat> the fees that we charge to the participants right now um, go towards the uh, program costs which do not include um, monies that go back directly to the school department they cover community services overhead cost and program costs okay. so has so no analysis has been done yet as to the amount of usage by community service activities in non-school hours in terms of electricity and heating? Not specifically for those particular activities where the buildings are open during after, the, um, the buildings still remain open during the hours that we use them for after school activities. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily the weekend activities that we offer, but the after school classes are, the buildings are still open. Um, there's, we're not keeping them open just for our activities. Right. right, so that was a poor choice of activity because obviously dodgeball happens right after school and it's still open for teachers and things like that. But there are probably a number of activities on the weekends for travel teams, et cetera, that perhaps we, I, I'm, just, I'm just asking, can we please engage in that Analysis is does this make sense or not? Go ahead. Um, we've had this discussion at extracurricular a couple times. A lot of our discussions this year have centered around Hannaford Field, but when it does come to other groups using our facilities, there are facilities charges there. Correct. That's correct. I, I, or, thought, I thought the question Rebecca was asking was specifically for community services activities. Right. Yes. But groups outside of community services are charged the fees associated with the activity. Right. So travel teams, that type of thing, Just are paying a facilities they are. fee. It, I was at that finance committee meeting. It, forgive me if I'm interpreting this properly, but to sort of address your point, for example, the travel teams, the fees, I thought you said, and again, maybe I'm wrong, that the fees for the travel teams do include all overhead costs with the exception of the debt. The debt service to community services. So technically they do, because Janet did come and did have an analysis that she presented. An allocation for debt was not, is not built into the fees, but electricity and heat and other charges for those other teams, not community service activities, the travel teams, that fee is included. For our building, not for the school building. But, okay, for example, now I'm curious. The travel basketball teams do not use your, your buildings. They use the school buildings and we pay a fee. What does that fee represent? That fee represents the um, activities, the fees associated specifically with activity, that activity, and the administrative cost to community services. It, overhead, it does not include any monies that go back to the school department itself. Okay, but, all right. So this is kind of an interesting quandary because technically community services is part of the school department. Mm -hmm. Correct, and community services provides a number of services to the school department um, at a, at a um, cost that's much less than other districts 
for the services that they provide. I need to be very clear. I'm not asking community services to pay the, the schools for the cost of opening our buildings and keeping it warm and running electricity. What I'm asking for is that the organizations that are requiring those buildings to be open pay for that cost and it will be passed on through the fee that is charged. So just as you cover the overhead for community services, you would include um, you, maintenance utility overhead for the school buildings. And that money would then go to the schools. It wouldn't come from your budget. It would come from those organizations that are utilizing our services. Um, in fairness, it, it, um, I have asked Ernie for outside organizations um, what it costs to, for example, run the lights in the high school gym. Um, we don't increase the um, the temperature in the gym when we have activities on weekends and things of that nature, but we do obviously run the lights and the cost was so minimal that it's not even a, a charge we would um, pass on to renters. Um, it's a, a few dollars, less than 10 I believe. Could, would you, could, could I make a suggestion that perhaps um, maybe the extracurricular look at this again, not necessarily from a financial standpoint, but from a financial standpoint, but also if you're really interested, I mean, I guess it's debatable too, because the kids that are participating, even though it's quote unquote travel, are our students. And, you know, they might, it, it, it's a sort of an extension of the community services program. So I, I don't know. I think we're in extraordinary times and we need to address, look at all aspects. I mean, it's, a, it's not a school sanctioned sport, it's travel. Is, is, it is, is this it's also under extracurricular? Or? Well, it's also a matter of policy in our facilities policy yeah. that is we have groups? revisited several times. Yeah. Um, so I think this is more of a finance issue. The policy is already in existence, but we're just not in, we're not. But actually, well, it, it's right because it it's does a fee address, structure. It does address yeah. fees. That's right. For use of facilities. Good this point. is a use of facilities fee. Uh, That's right. Policy. So it would have, that's a way we could, you could okay. look at it if you want to look at it again. It's the use of facilities. It's a but fee structure. We do look at it from the relationship of the group to the citizens here in Cape Elizabeth. Yeah. As far as groups within Cape Elizabeth, and that does sometimes include travel groups and those groups outside of Cape Elizabeth involving our citizens, where we don't charge a facilities fee to those groups mm -hmm. involving students within Cape Elizabeth. Does that answer your question? No, that's okay. <laughs> well, I think Linda's suggestion, Linda's, Linda's point is well taken that yeah. if this wants to be, if right. you want to pursue it, what you want. I would say right. that policy is the way to do it because we do have a policy that guides the fee structure. You know, I, I, I actually, all I wanted Thank was an you. analysis. I didn't, I'm not necessarily pushing for a particular answer one way or the other. I just wanted somebody to say, how much money are we talking here and does this make sense? And I think I've asked this like three times, and I, I guess it seems overwhelming to, to, to whomever, but you know, I'm, in these times, I'm just looking for approaches and solutions. And you know, it, we have a high usage of our buildings, and does it make sense to include in that, that fee that we charge them, the cost of heating and electricity? If it doesn't make sense, if it's not financially, it doesn't have that big of a financial impact, then fine. But just can we have an analysis with some sort of an answer? Thank you, Janet. Um, any other questions, comments? Okay, um, public comment on agenda items. I don't think there's anybody here from the public, so. Uh, <laughs> Um, any school board agenda requests for upcoming meetings? Um, announcements of upcoming meetings, they are posted on the website. Um, I think policy committee may be being rescheduled, so stay tuned. Personnel will be rescheduled. And personnel will be rescheduled too. So um, those will, please, the website will be updated accordingly. Um, and any other comments on meetings? If not, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Sorry, it's here until we can. Don't worry about it.